Time have arrived for the Finance Committee for Monday, April 7, 2014. I hereby call the meeting to order. Councilors, I'd like to, uh, first uh, agenda item tonight, I'd like to uh, take a moment of silence for a few different uh, dedicated public servants that passed away. Uh, Harry Owens, uh, who we know as a great Brocktonian, uh, served this city very, very well in, in many, many different capacities. He was always a fixture to Council on Aging. Uh, he was a candidate, of course, for, uh, for uh, Ward 3 uh, a while back. Um, just a, a real good, good person. He passed away last week, and I'd like to take a moment and, uh, and honor him uh, right now. May he rest in peace. Amen. Also, of course, Constance, we haven't been here in a while because last Monday was the fifth Monday. Uh, but a couple of great public servants to the Commonwealth passed away. Of course, we lost the two firefighters, uh, uh, Firefighter Kennedy and uh, Lieutenant Walsh passed away, and also uh, the police officer down at Plymouth. And uh, I've been asked to take a moment of silence for those three uh, dedicated public servants that uh, paid the ultimate price. If we could take a moment of silence, please. May they rest in peace. Thank you, Councilors. Mr. President. <coughs> Council Dubois. I'd like to make a motion to take number um, <coughs> 21 out of order. Second. Thank you. Motion's made properly second to take number 21 out of order. All in favor of that motion, raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. That motion carries. Madam Clerk, number 21 out of order, please. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Rockton require the laying out of Eastfield Drive. Invited Howard B. Newton, Superintendent of Engineering, Jacques Wojcic, Engineer of Rockton DPW. Mr. President. Council Dubois. Um, may I ask, um, by a raise of hands, who is here about the Eastfield Drive matter? Great, wonderful. Okay, um, Mr. Newton. Good evening, Mr. Newton. Good evening. How are you tonight, sir? Good. Thanks for being here. Uh, Eastfield Drive, as you, as you know, has been up for acceptance before. I know there are a lot of rumors flying about. Uh, I've spoken with many of the residents of Eastfield Drive and set their, I believe I've set their concerns at ease. The street is not going to go through. Uh, that, that was the biggest concern. And then someone was in today about uh, the city's going to build uh, multifamily housing up there, which is another rumor. That's false, absolutely false. It's the, the layout is simply the taking of the street, making a portion of Eastfield Drive public. It will be dead end. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to reiterate your, your statement that um, this is the first step in a process to get the street repaved. Unless the street is accepted as a public way, um, Chapter 90 monies that flow to the city to repair our roads cannot be used on that street. So since Eastfield Drive, as many streets in Ward 6 are in, is in deplorable condition, um, this is the first step in that process. And can you, just for people listening at home, kind of explain where the repaving is going to stop on Eastfield Drive? I carried this layout to the to approximately 25 feet beyond the last driveway on the street, which is on the right-hand side. This, the pavement, if and when the city gets in there to construct it, will end somewhere 100 plus or minus feet short of Holmes Avenue. It will not go through to Holmes Avenue. It won't it won't affect the lots on either side at the corners of Holmes Avenue. Now, is, does this require a public hearing? Absolutely. And when will that happen? It's supposed to be right now. Yeah, is, is that what we'll be doing? I mean, that, that isn't, the public hearing isn't right this second, right? It's, when does that happen? Council. council, we have to do it next week at the full city council if it's a favorable recommendation back to the council. I appreciate that. So those of you at home, so during the public hearing, residents um, can speak for or against. Correct. So if you're interested in speaking in support or in opposition of making Eastfield Drive public, you should come to city council um, next Monday at 8 p.m. I hope that everybody is in support of it, and if they are not, feel free to call me. My cell phone is 774-274-1344, or email me at my city mail account, and we can talk about that. Does that sound okay with you, Howard? You have been talking to people, right? My understanding is tonight is the public hearing. It always has been in the past. Why would you notify the residents to have them here tonight? 
Mr. Not having a public hearing tonight. It's Ms. always been public hearing has always been held before finance because that's where people can speak. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Um, Ms. Mr. President, is there any way we could ask the, just the three residents from Eastfield Drive if they have any input so they don't have to come back next week? Council, when we have any the objection hearing? to Council Dubois saying none? I, uh, I agree um, to that. Does anyone that lives in or, in or around, on or around Eastfield Drive, would you like to be heard on this matter at this time? If you would, please come to the podium and just let us know. Otherwise, you could always come next week as well. Just come on right up here. Howard, stay close by, because we might need you to help me answer this question. My, my only question is Ma'am, if, ma if you could just state your name and your address for the record, please. Diana Burns, 43 East Road Drive. Thank you. My only question is about sidewalks. So are we just paving the road and that's it? Or is there an intention to take some of our land and make a sidewalk? So there's no intention to install a sidewalk. And it wouldn't just be paving over your road. They would literally be digging it up and laying a better infrastructure for drainage and making it right up to grade. But there's no plan for sidewalks. Howard, I, you can, you're, you're agreeing with me that there's no plan to install high sidewalks on Eastfield Drive, correct? If you could just, this is the you know, city's engineer, so we'll hear from him as well. That, that is correct. Great. Uh, there aren't any plans to pave it at this point in time. Yeah. But it cannot be paved until, it's, until the street is public. And when it is paved, can you just go through what the process would be? And then. The councilors, as you know, annually the councilors submit a list of streets that they want paved in their wards. Those go to the mayor and to the Commissioner of Public Works. Decision is made based on the amount of money that is available, which street, which of those streets are going to be paved. So it would be on the list. Do you have any other um, comments? Thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank Is there you. any other uh, resident that resides on that street that wants to come forward right now? Council, I'm going to entertain a motion. I would like to motion to approve, please. Second. Second. Council, Stenitsky on the motion. On that motion, uh, do we ask if anybody here is opposed? Public hearing, don't we ask if anybody here is opposed? We, we could do that, Council. I, I, I don't believe the public hearing is tonight myself. I think this is, this is a committee. Uh, we should have a, a full Strike. finance committee, a uh, full Strike city council questions. next week. But uh, with that being said, I'll honor that request. Is there anybody here in attendance tonight that has an issue or an opposition relative to this request? <coughs> Seeing none, I entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion is made properly seconded for a favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. A motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Council Cruz. I uh, make a motion uh, to take uh, item, excuse me, I don't need to stand. Item 28 out of order. Second. <laughs> motion is made property second to take number 28. Resolve out of order. Council, this is my resolve. I'm going to make a motion uh, through Council Cruz, because I'm the chair, uh, to continue this. Reason being is Aquaria has notified us, and I did tell uh, the mayor uh, about this uh, information. Uh, it's a letter dated April 4th. The letter is in response to the invitation of the Finance Committee to a meeting on April 7th, 2014. At 7 p.m., Aquaria's general manager, Moises Parente, will not be able to attend due to a conflict in his travel schedule. Aquaria respectfully asks future correspondence to be sent via email to assure timely receipt and ample time to coordinate the general manager's travel as he needs to come to Massachusetts from out of state. With that being said, we're going to give them two weeks. We're going to make a motion uh, through you, Councilor. You all set? Yeah. Make, make a motion to postpone until the next Second. finance meeting. Second. Second. Motion is made properly seconded <coughs> to uh, continue this matter to the next finance committee meeting. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. That motion, uh, motion carries. It's continued to the next fin call, Madam Clerk. Council's not going to take any more out of order tonight. We're going to go to number one, please. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Council, do you have one? If we might, we have, we have our engineer here. Could he uh, speak on uh, Absolutely, Council. number 24, I, I believe I didn't see is. that. 22. 22. 22. 22. 22. <coughs> it's in the form of a motion. Second. Motion to be made properly second to take 22 out of order. All in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Number 22, please, Madam Clerk. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out of Fairbanks Road. Invited Howard B. Newton, Superintendent of Engineering, Jock Borges, Engineer of Brockton DPW. Good evening again, Mr. Newton. Uh, Fairbanks Road is a subdivision street, and as such, there's already a plan recorded at the Registry of Deeds 
same same situation as East Field Drive in that we did except that we did not have to draw a new plan for the acceptance of that. It's again the, the only taking is the, <coughs> excuse me is the street itself. Uh, there are no takings of private property of any kind. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Then any questions? No, no plan uh, to go through with a through street there. Or with Appleby or anything like that. Is there any plan? Any I'm plan sorry. to run that down to Appleby? As far as I, it's the whole street is what is in for acceptance. Thank you. Uh, but if, if, if it isn't currently all built, the city, when they went in to repave, would not build any more than, again, enough to service the residents on the street. If it doesn't go through to the other street, it wouldn't be built. Thank you, Ms. Newton, very much. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. Is there anybody here in attendance tonight that wants to speak on this? Any resident? Since we did it for number 21, I'll entertain it for 22. Madam, please come forward. Good evening. Um, Ma'am, if you could just, just state your name. Shirley, name to the uh, Shirley Ellison. Yes. 55 Fairbanks. And I was just wondering, I thought 10 to 15 years ago we got accepted as a street. Are we or not? Mr. Newton, the question was, she believes 15 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, this was accepted? But we can, but we can get a new street. New the process payment. right now, ma'am, is to see if the city will accept it as a public way as opposed to a private way. And the city, just for uh, information purposes, the city of Brockton has many private ways. Uh, the city does maintain those. Uh, we don't get Chapter 90 credit relative to that. We expend the time and the money and the resources and the man hours to do that. However, the state doesn't recognize that because they are private ways as opposed to public ways. Do we have to do anything? I thought we got a petition and everything back then. Do we have to do anything to get the road accepted? No, ma'am. It's before us right, right now. Thank you very much, ma'am. Anybody else here tonight? Anybody in opposition relative to this matter? I entertain a motion, Councils. I'd like to move this favorably to the full Council. Second. Second. Motion is made by Councilor Stanensky, properly seconded for a favorable recommendation back to the full City Council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. Matter carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full City Council, Madam Clerk. Number one, please. Appointment, Gary Keith of 94 Provo Street, Brockton, to the Brockton Planning Board for a five-year term ending March 2019. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Keith. To work your way through, you gotta throw some elbows at Gary. What way is this? How are you tonight, sir? I'm doing fine, thank you. Good evening. Do you have a statement? What's that, sir? Do you have a statement? Um, no, it's just that I'm looking very forward to uh, serving the city of Brockton in any capacity that I can. Um, I thank the mayor for giving me this opportunity, and hopefully the council finds uh, a, favorable, a favorable vote. I motion to approve. Second. <laughs> Motions were made properly second favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. Matter carries. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Keith. Have a good night. Number two, Madam Clerk. Appointment, Ollie Spears, to the Brockton Planning Board for five-year term ending March 2019. Mr. Spears, good evening tonight. Good evening. How are you? How are you, sir? Do you have a statement? I um, just want to thank the mayor and the city council um, for my appointment. <laughs> Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motions been made. Properly second. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Spears. Good evening. Number three, Madam Clerk. Appointment: Ross Messina the second to the Brockton Planning Board for a five-year term ending March 2019. Invited Ross Messina. Messina, good evening. Good evening. How are you tonight? I'm good, yourself. Good, thank you. Do you have any uh, statement you want to make or entertain? No, I'm just happy to be appointed. I appreciate it. I look forward to serving the city and hopefully can bring a younger pers perspective to the planning board. Thank you, sir. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion's been made properly. Second. A favor recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Thank you. Number four, please. Appointment. Galeb Younes to the Brockton Conservation Commission for a three-year term ending March 2017. Eunice, good evening. Good evening. How are you tonight? How are you? Good, thank you. Any, any statement? I don't have no statement. I would like to thank you and thank the mayor for the opportunity and uh, I'm, more, I'm very excited to help our city and 
this is all what I have to say. Thank motion you, to recommend Secretary. favorably. Second. Second. <coughs> Motion has been made. It's been properly seconded. It's a favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. Please raise your hand if you're in favor. Raise your hand if you're opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Number five, please. Appointment. Craig Pina to the Brockton Conservation Commission for a three-year term ending March 2017. Mr. Pina, good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thankful for the uh, nomination of the mayor for the appointment of the Conservation Commission. I look forward to serving the city. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion's been made. It's been properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor, raise your hand, please. If you're opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Number six, please. Appointment. Bernie Hassan to the Brockton Water Commission for a three-year term ending March 2017. Mr. Mr. President. How are you, sir? Good and you? You have a statement you want to make? I don't have a statement, but I do wish to thank the city council and the mayor for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to uh, assist the city in any way I can. Thank you. Motion to approve. approve. Thank you. Motion's been made. Properly seconded. Favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. If you're in favor of that, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. And motion carries. Favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. Number seven, please. Appointment Stephen Hook, Emergency Management Director for the City of Brockton. Mr. Hook, good evening. Good evening. Same question. Do you have a statement? <laughs> I want to thank the Mayor and the City Council for uh, the opportunity to serve my hometown. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion <clears throat> on the motion? On the motion, just want to say you have some tough shoes to fill. Mr. Schleff did a wonderful job for the city all these years, so good luck. Thank you. I appreciate it, and I know that. Motion's been made, properly second. A favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Thanks, Thank Mr. You. Hook. Favorable recommendation back to the full council. Number eight, please. Appointment Lisa Shea to the Brockton Cable Advisory Board for a three year term ending March 2017. Ms. Shea, are you in attendance tonight? I'm going to move to postpone. Postpone to later in the evening or postpone to the next Fen call? Let's postpone to later in the evening. Maybe Se she'll show up. What Second. Do you think? Motion's made to postpone. We're going to take it later in the evening. All in favor of that motion, raise your hand. All opposed. We're going to uh, postpone that to later tonight, Madam Clerk. Number nine, please. Appointment. Manuel Santillo to the Brockton Community Cable Television Board for a three year term ending March 2017. Invited Manuel Santillo. Good evening, Mr. Santillo. Good evening, Mr. Sullivan. Do you have a statement, sir? No, I don't. I just want to thank the mayor and the city council for having me here and appointing me to the BCA board. Motion to move favorable to the full council. Motion, 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 Mr. Hi, Mr. Centio, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I uh, appreciate your uh, interest in the cable board and serving. Uh, we've gotten a, a packet of resumes from individuals, um, and for some reason I think I've missed yours. So I just have a couple questions for you because I wasn't able to review your resume. Yeah, go um, ahead. Uh, can you just tell me a, a bit about your interest in this particular position? Um, I just want to get involved in the city. Um, I've been a board member for the Cape Verde Association. I think I can bring um, a little new, new, new stuff to the board of the BCA. Um, okay. Um, I, I actually I missed it in the packet for some reason. And just a bit about your experience in cable or media. Um, I don't have any experience in cable or media, but I want to get involved and learn more. You know, I'm willing to work with the board members on the BCA now and also Mark, which I've already met and talked to a few times. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you, Council. Uh, Council Stensky, you made a motion, correct? I did. Was it seconded? Second. Second. By Council Rodriguez, seconded. Motion was made properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor, raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Number uh, 10, please. Appointment. Appointment. Morton Schleffler to the Brockton Traffic Commission for a three year term ending March 2017. Invite Morton Schleffler. Schleffler. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see all of you again, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing working with the city and uh, be a pleasure working with Chief Galligan again. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion was made properly second. A favorable recommendation back to the council, full city council. All in favor of that, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Schleffer. Madam Clerk, number 11, please. Appointment, Orlando de Graca Montero to the, as a constable in the city of Brockton for a three-year term. Invited Orlando de Graco Montero. Good evening, Mr. Montero. Good evening. You have a uh, statement, sir. Uh, thanks to the mayor and the city council to give me opportunity the work for the city of Brockton. Thank you, sir. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, uh, good evening, Mr. Montero. 
Is your name Yolando or Yolanda? Yolando. Yolando. So there's a no at the end of the uh, D-O. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, a question of everybody that's actually uh, been um, asking the city council to appoint him on specific positions here in the city. Are your taxes up to date with yes, the city? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes? Uh, no further questions. Thank you, Council. I entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motions were made properly second in favor of recommendation of this appointment back to the full city council. All in favor of that? Please raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Thank you. Number uh, 12, Madam Clerk. Mr. President. Councilor. I'd like to make a motion to take number 12, 16, 17, and 18 collectively. Can't do it. Uh, uh, number 12 is an appointment and 13 are reappointments. Oh, we can't take them no. collectively? Okay, then forget it. We'll take, uh, we'll take 12 right now, Madam Clerk. All right. Appointment. Getchens Polonese uh, Brockton as a constable in the city of Brockton for a three-year term. Good evening, Ms. Polonese. How are you? Fine, right, thank you, sir. Do you have a statement, sir? No, sir. I want to say thank you to Mr. Mayor and to Councilor in Brockton. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for being here. Councilor Rodriguez. Well, I'm going to ask the same question, sir. Um, you know, when you're being appointed to a constable in the city, it, it carries some responsibilities, and uh, both citizens and taxpayers in this community look at constables as law enforcement people. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Are your taxes and obligations to the city of Brockton all up to date and paid? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. No, no, more, no more questions. Thank Chairman. you, Councilor. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Motion is made properly second a favorable <coughs> recommendation of this appointment back to the full city council. Raise your hand if you're in favor. Raise your hand if you oppose. That motion carries. Recommend full city council favorably. Madam Clerk. Reappointment. Kenneth Galligan, Brockton to the Brockton Traffic Commission for a three year term ending March 2017. Invited Kenneth Galligan. Chief, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Do you have a statement, sir? Yeah, I want to thank the mayor for the appointment to the Traffic Commission. I'm looking forward to continuing my service on the Traffic Commission to the city of Brockton. Mr. Chairman. On the, yes. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Council. How many years have you served on the Traffic Commission? 21 years. Uh, well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to see you back, and uh, you, I, I served with you for many years, and, and you do an outstanding job. Thank you. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. 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 Motion is made properly seconded. Favorable uh, reappointment back to the full City Council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Thank Thanks, you, Councilor. Have a good night. Uh, number 14, Madam Clerk. Reappointment, Ozzie Jordan of Brockton to the Brockton Water Commission for a three-year term ending March 2017. Invited Ozzie Jordan. Mr. Jordan, good evening. Good evening. You have a statement, sir? Yes, I want to thank you for an opportunity to uh, continue serving on the Water Commission so we can uh, keep the good things going that we've started. Motion to approve. Uh, actually, a question on the no motion. motion. Council. Uh, Mr. Jordan, do you have any aspirations or interests in any other positions in the city? Yes, I do. Thank you. Any other questions? Motion's been made. It's been properly seconded, correct? Who seconded that? I don't know. Everybody. Second. I think I did. Council made a second. Motion's made properly second reappointment. Uh, favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Number 15, Madam Clerk. Reappointment. Robert Harrington Brockton as a member of the Board of Assessors for the City of Brockton for a three-year term ending March 2017. Invited Robert Harrington. Mr. Harrington, good evening. Good evening, Mr. How Sullivan. You, sir? How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Councilors. Mayor. Do you have a statement, Mr. Harrington? No statement. I would just like to thank the mayor, obviously, and the city council for a chance to for a reappointment for another three years as a part-time member of the Board of Assessors. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to on the motion myself. Mr. Harrington worked for many years in a neighboring community, the town of Randolph. The Brock, city of Brockton is very lucky that we have him. He does a, a yeoman's job for the city of Brockton, so uh, I support this 100%. Motion made properly seconded full city council uh, for this reappointment. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Thank you, Councilor. Good night. Councilors, for uh, number 16, we have a letter. I'd like to read it into the record. It's on uh, letterhead, Constables of New England, William R. Thomas, Jr., Constable, dated April 3, uh, 2014, to uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Raymond. In regards to your letter dated March 25th, 2014, with regret, I am unable to attend the Standing Committee on F Finance on April 7th, Monday, April 7th, 2014, as I will be out of state from Saturday, April 5 through April 12 with prior commitment. 
I would appreciate it if you would thank the city councilors and the mayor for my reappointment. It's re regards uh, William R. Uh, Thomas Jr., constable slash owner. Move to approve. approve. Second. Second. Motion's made properly second for reappointments. A favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. I'll oppose that motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Number 17, please. Reappointment, David Lynch is a constable in the city of Rockton for a term of three years. Invited David Lynch. Councilor uh, DiNapoli. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Councilors, we were informed by Mr. Lynch. He was unable to, <coughs> respectfully, uh, unable to attend tonight. Motions made properly second in favor of recommendation for the reappointment back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, number 18, please. Reappointment, Kenneth LeGrice Brockton as a constable in the city of Brockton for a term of three years. Invited Kenneth LeGrice. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good, Good evening. Do you have a statement? Just to say thank you. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. On the question. Council Rodriguez. <clears throat> Uh, just to be fair, and I want to be an equal abuser, everybody that comes up here today <laughs> looking for a, a reappointment or appointment, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked the gentleman before you. Are your taxes and uh, obligations up to date and payable and yes. paid to the city? Yes. No more questions. <clears throat> no more questions from Council Rodriguez. The motion was made. It was properly second. Favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council relative to the reappointment of Mr. LeGrice. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, the motion carries. Thank you, sir. Have a Thank good night. You. Councils, we're going to go to number 19. Uh, just want to let you know, Attorney Gilday, our legislative council, called me. Uh, he is running a little late. He is en route. He will be here. Uh, but I, I don't think we should, should hold it up unless you uh, will the council. Do you think that we need to uh, have Attorney Gilday here? We do? Yeah. Okay. We're going we're gonna to move that then. Number 20, please. Order a transfer of $11,864 from the Personnel Department Employee Benefits Unemployment to the Mayor's Department Personal Services in order to pay for separation costs paid to Mayor Balzotti's staff. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, <coughs> John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Maureen Cruz, Personnel Director. Mr. Condon, good evening. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, this now is, I think, the third time this uh, issue has come before you. The first time was embedded in another order, uh, was submitted back on January 7th. It was recommended unfavorably and disapproved by the Council. Second time it was recommended for funding out of a, a surplus in my budget from a vacancy, and that failed by one vote of adoption. And we're hopeful that, again, this is a, a different vote because it's from a different funding source this time from unemployment compensation. But it's for payment of uh, uh, separation costs uh, that were due and payable to the former mayor's staff on their departure at the conclusion of their term, which was the 7th of January when the order was submitted the first time for payment. It has uh, been uh, the practice, I think, of the city since I've been here that uh, those kinds of separation costs aren't imposed on a new mayor's budget because they're not budgeted in the first instance. So we're hopeful that this time I can, we can get a favorable vote from you. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. second. Motion to made properly second. A favorable recommendation <clears throat> back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation number thank 20 thank back you, to the full city council. We already did 21, we did 22. Council Gilday is not here. We'll go to number 23. Order that the City Council hereby establishes the application fee required by the ordinance to be $1,500 regulating the locations of medical marijuana, cultivation, harvesting, dispensing, and other related activities as allowed by Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Invited John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Richard C. Francis, Fire Chief, Robert Hayden, Interim Police Chief, James Cassiri, Superintendent of Building, John McCluskey, Esquire, PC Law Office. Mr. President. Mr. Uh, I can wait. I can wait. If, I can wait. if we could, yes, because it, it was the original order that I had signed, and I know we had uh, moved it to send it to finance. So if I might, Mr. Chairman, just to speak briefly on this, because I think we, we need to understand, again, just what we were discussing at that last meeting in regards to this particular $1,500 that this is what we are calling an application fee. And I think councils need to understand that there's a separation between application fee and for other types of monies that we would like to see coming in from the business in itself as two different things. I know there was some discussion at the last meeting in regards to why couldn't the, be, the fee be $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. There's no fee in the city of Brockton for any such application for any type of um, fee 
pertaining to materials and in, in, in the working relationship that has to establish a fee be that type of money. So I just want everybody to have a clear understanding. And, and as I quoted in this evening's uh, newspaper, and I think Councilor Moynihan and I were on the right path, I'm sure everybody else is, that it's a, you have to keep it separate. If you're looking for the business to bring something else to the table, and I think the mayor has had discussion with the contractor in some such way that that could possibly be a possibility, I don't have a problem with that because other cities and towns are already doing that, and that's what's happening in, in with this business. Um, I'm sure the attorneys can speak, and I'm sure uh, Attorney um, McCluskey is here re representing the contractor that would be coming in to, to open the business that's, that's going to be located here in the city of Brockton. Um, and just for quick history, I mean, it's going to be up in the industrial commercial zoned area in the city of Brockton, probably the, the only largest spot we have left, and it is in Ward 3, and, and I did take it on as the counselor in allowing to, to be located there because we all thought it was best through the ordinance committee last year and through the help of even Council Dubois that we located in a place that would be outside of the helm of neighborhoods and, and that's why the business is going to that particular location. Whether we wanted it or not, we had to have a location or DPH was going to tell you where it was going to be. But just going back to what we're going to discuss now, keep the, the fee application separate so if you're looking for fifty, sixty, or hundred thousand dollars to come from the business in any such way to help out the city of Brockton is another situation. But but the fee is the fee, and I think we need to understand that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. And then point of information, uh, Attorney Gilday, just a reminder, uh, as legislative counsel, he did articulate to us that it has to be a fair and reasonable fee uh, relative to the application process and the time that the city employees for the various departments would need to uh, to process the application. Uh, Mr. Casari, thank you for being here tonight. How are you, counselors? Well, I'll answer you. any questions. And I also was wondering if, if the, the chief and I had spoken, we, we read this ordinance and we saw a couple little things that we didn't think were going to work quite right with it. I don't know if this is the place to do that or if we're just going to talk about the fee. We're <coughs> strictly on this uh, order item, it's strictly the application fee. But if there's another thing we can entertain that at a later date, we'll go through the process, uh, the practice and procedure, Mr. Casari. We'll, we'll do that. Okay. Mr. President, Council Dubois. thank you. Um, I, I have questions, but I'm going to start off with um, just putting my cards on the table and saying that I, at the end of the meeting, I'm going to motion to change the $1,500 fee to $2,700. And I've come to that determination, and it doesn't, you know, everybody has the right to um, not approve it or not vote for it if they don't want. But I'm assuming when this application comes in, especially in the nature of it being the first application that the city is going to look at, that in my estimation, and this is just my estimation, that the city solicitor might spend like five hours, someone in his office looking it over, and I've just, for average, times that by $50 an hour. In the fire department, maybe people in your department will take some average of 10 hours looking it over. And uh, the police department might take 10 hours looking it over, and I times that by $50, about an hour. And then Mr. Kassiri, you might take 10 hours looking it over, and I times that by $50. And then the planning board might take 10, Pam, 10 hours, and I times that by $30. And then um, I bet that a consultant through Nova Armstrong would be asked to look at it, and that might take five hours. And I just estimated her cost at $100 an hour, but it may even be more than that. And then um, assistant building um, someone in, in Mr. Casieri's department might take five hours, and I times that by 30, and that's how I came up to 2,700. And it's in the meetings that I've had with Mr. Casieri um, about this project where we're looking at some of the uh, fees that we're charging for developers right now, and those fees are literally not covering the costs for the city to review the, the documents. So I'm fair with not overcharging someone, but as it stands right now, Brockton is literally paying other people to come in and submit files to us, and that isn't right either. So I think that a fairer cost would be 2700 but each of you gentlemen could take some time and maybe tell me if you think that that might be a good estimation of your department's time on this project, or if it's lower or higher. What do you think? No, I think that that sounds fair, what you're talking about, Councillor. There's, there's a lot in here that when someone comes, like and Mr. McCluskey has already put an application in to go to the zoning board, um, I don't see how a clerk taking the application in could possibly know that everything that was supposed to be in that application is there. Yeah. 
Um, and that's what I was alluding to with some minor glitches in here. Um, there's a spot in here where it talks about the, uh, the, the medical marijuana people have to go to uh, site plan review. To me, that should happen before they go to zoning because the zoning board members shouldn't be deciding whether or not the safety plan is the right plan or if the traffic's working the right way. It should go to the zoning board after it went through site plan review with perhaps a favorable recommendation from the planning board. That way, the zoning board members, they're just volunteers. They're not public officials. They don't understand all of these things that, that we, we understand. And we vet things out in the plan review process. The chief is there, both chiefs, uh, the water department's there, the fire, everybody, all the public officials. You've been to those meetings, I'm sure you all have. That should happen before they get to zoning. And if, that's all cost. That's all permit review cost. Correct, but that's, this is making them go to site plan review after they've already been approved by people who don't understand what they're approving. Mm -hmm. And that's just... So one that's point an I amendment we'll make. have to put in, and we'll put it in for the next Monday's meeting, and then it'll have to go through its natural process. But, but that's meanwhile, there's an application in to go to zoning now, so. Now, I, I, I was under the impression that state said that no application could be accepted until the city's um, ordinance is completed, and this, this fee is part of the city's ordinance. So I that's don't understand. That's my contention. I think that that was a, that was a mistake on your department's part for accepting it. We, we have to accept the application. We can't deny anybody access to the board. But, the but state if the law application says, is incomplete, it would be denied at that hearing. So are you saying that the application will be denied because our, our permitting process I, I is I can't answer how they'll vote, but I'm sure that that will, could be a possibility. When was the permit submitted? It, it was, uh, Mr. McCluskey brought it in a few weeks ago and we were going to we were talking about putting him on the meeting for May. So does that mean we should call the Attorney General's office for some clarification on how this law is being interpreted, or has the city solicitor been contacted about that? Because the Attorney General was pretty specific, in, as I understand it, in, in, in the, the whole process, in their finding that until an ordinance is completed and accepted, that no permits would be filed. So That's how I read it. But when I read 40A, it also tells me that I can't deny anybody access to the Zoning Board of Appeals that I have to give them access to the board and what happens at that time. Like we've accepted applications that don't have a clean municipal lien certificate and they've been denied at zoning. We made the mistake at one time saying you can't go to zoning because you don't have a clean M MLC and that was wrong. We have to let them go through the process and, and deny it at that So how point. many hours have you spent on reviewing this whole process so far since you've received the application? Thinking about it, how many hours have you a spent? Lot. Think, more than More than 10? Yeah. So you've already, out, you've already blown the budget on this permit that I've estimated at 10 hours at $50 an hour. So, I mean, this $2,700 is probably we're going to be paying people to come and apply to us at this point. I mean, and that, you know, for a multi-million dollar business doesn't seem really appropriate. Um, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Would anyone else like to talk about how many hours they might expect to be um, reviewing this? Please, Chief. Evening, Councilors. Um, <clears throat> I talked with Lieutenant Williams tonight. He had told me he's already spent 10 hours researching and doing some preliminary stuff with Mr. McCluskey. He figures at least another 20 hours before he would sign off on anything. Okay, I'm just using my calculator here. All right, so that's, that's $4,000 right now. Thank you so much, Chief. Interim Chief Frank, um, Hayden, would you have any estimation on how long your department might take looking, looking at this permit application? About four hours at this point in time. And that's what you've already spent, or that's what you've already spent? When you say spent, this was on duty um, uh, perusing of the uh, plan, so it didn't, I don't think it cost anybody anything. Well, it cost them your hourly wage. That's what I was thinking. Oh, I got you, yeah. About. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so at this time, I'd like to make a motion to strike 1500 and replace it with $4,000. I had some questions first, if we can. Oh, sure. Wasn't well, oh, no, and Council, I, the motion I would wasn't like seconded, my, so you don't have to withdraw okay. it. So, so, I, so I don't have to withdraw it, so nobody's seconding wasn't that. It wasn't seconded, so it dies right okay. there, Councilor. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Um, 
Good evening, Attorney McCluskey. But uh, first, uh, Mr. Kasiri, if you can come back up. I just want to make sure I understand what we're doing. Is it a building permit he's come in for so far, or? It's a zoning board approval for a special permitted use. For a special permitted use. Correct. Right. Okay, so it's not a building permit, and we don't, we don't need to make any, a new permit for this, do we, or should well, we? Well, it's kind of funny, because I was talking about that today with April and Pam, um, that there's so many things in that that aren't in the ordinary application, how will the clerk know if they've met all of those obligations unless there's an application that they would check each item off that that's in there? And the, the clerk's going to take this in. Right. And the problem with us taking, I know what you're saying, we've been through that question before that you can't deny the access. Right. But if, and again, maybe Attorney McCluskey wants to speak to this, but you can, um, if they go forward and the zoning board denies them, they have to wait a year to come back, correct? Yeah, two years. Two years, unless they make substantial changes, and right. I guess that's always a judgment call. But yeah. um, So it behooves all of us to get this right before we move forward. It would be in everybody's best interest, in my opinion, to get this ordinance exactly the way you want it before we allow somebody to be approved. That's and, just my opinion. And part of that ordinance, getting it done, is, I mean, you could argue that once we finalize this dollar amount, that we've finalized the whole the whole ordinance. Correct, and and keep in mind as I as I've stated that this ZBA board is a volunteer board. Right. They're not public officials who have the wherewithal to make some of the decisions they're being asked to make. In my opinion. Right, and with this this is a whole different ball of wax. It's not something that happens anywhere else. You know, it's a one-time thing, pretty much. And uh, it's only going to happen a couple times, probably. Exactly, counsel. and uh, it's really we're depending on you and the fire chief and the police chief pretty much those three departments to say, yeah, we're comfortable with where we are, you know, right. specifically. Um, but yeah, so that worries me that uh, if we let it move forward, um, I mean, the attorney might withdraw the night of the zoning board if he realizes that th they're not comfortable with it because those department heads are not comfortable with it. But uh, once we finalize this, basically we finalize the ordinance and we could then be kind of creating a, just a, a can of worms that we need to we don't need to get into yet. Right. Um, if I could ask Attorney McCluskey, so you've applied to get to zoning. Where is the process with the state, though? On I know there's been questions about the licenses themselves. Okay, the uh, for the record, Attorney John McCluskey represent In Good Health, which is the applicant uh, uh, which has uh, received a provisional uh, license or approval from the Department of Public Health. Uh, the process is. You go to the Department of Public Health, you submit your application, you get a provisional approval. The next thing you do is go to the local ZBA. And, and by the way, incidentally, not all cities and towns have uh, adopted an ordinance. Some have just said, we're going to let it go and, and come and apply and, and we'll just handle it that way. Uh, but Brockton obviously has a new ordinance. So that ordinance we, says that we have to go for a special permit. Once we get that special permit, then we go back and, const and the site plan approval as part of the ordinance. Once we get the special uh, permit and the, and the site plan approval, we then construct the, the facility. And then the last part is that the state comes in, inspects it, determines whether you're in compliance, and then that's the final approval. After that, of course, every year they have uh, annual uh, checkups and, and inspections and spot in uh, inspections, et cetera. So we're in that phase right now where my client, as you've read in the paper, many, everybody that got approvals are continuing to work with the Department of Public Health, uh, recertifying, resubmitting letters, uh, interviews with them, and, and that's what my client's doing. But in the meantime, they've actually, the Department of Public Health has submitted a schedule. Uh, January of, of uh, 14 was the provisional approvals. March, they're going through this uh, re-evaluation. They've got, the Department of Public Health uh, has got the spring of 2014 for the construction of the projects, and by summer of 2014, they're expecting these uh, entities to open. They, and, that, and that's interesting because the part of it is that they want to put the pressure on the applicant to keep moving forward. So Brockton has an ordinance. Um, it, it's somewhat, there's, there's duplication in the ordinance. There are four divisions or four departments that we have to go to. 
Department of, uh, the, the Board of Health, uh, the Fire Department, Police Department, and the Building Department. But then we also have to go to site plan approval. And the site plan approval, my understanding is historically, we go to site plan approval after we go to Board of Appeals, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, although I think we're going to be submitting for the um, um, uh, initial review with the planning board early on. But I think typically, planning board has not allowed site plan approval to be approved until zoning board. So what, what I'm hearing tonight is the exact opposite of, of what usually happens. Um, <clears throat> what, what I think the, the important thing here is that although each department, and as Mr. Kassiri said, that you know, the, the, the ordinance is, is a little convoluted, it's a little confusing, and uh, in particular, the fact that we have to go to these departments beforehand when we actually go to them again in site plan approval. So we're going to do it twice. That's right. uh, quite frankly, we've, we've been working uh, diligently with Lieutenant Williams and the fire chief has uh, appointed uh, Mr. Williams to, to help out. We've had a great relationship with him. He's been out to the site. We've gone through a lot of the fire suppression issues. We've gone through the fire safety issues. And, and we've gone through the architectural matters. Uh, we've got our architect working uh, to give a point-by-point -point presentation to Lieutenant Williams, which I think at the end of the day, all of the departments will, will uh, be helped with. And in fact, site plan approval, will, will, that will facilitate the site plan approval process. I think your suggestion is to, to hold it up tonight isn't a good one, quite frankly. Um, we are going to go to site plan approval and the Zoning Board of Appeals will have actually in this particular case will have what many other, if I were building a, a high rise in Brockton, Project Downtown Brockton, we go to site, you'd go to site plan approval after the Zoning Board of Appeals if they had to give any approvals. Here you're going to have input, the Zoning Board will have input from, um, I think it's what it's going to boil down to is the fire department because they've gone through a lot of the due diligence already and we're meeting a lot of those issues that are coming up and we'll have it fairly well vetted by the time we get to the zoning board of, of appeals to hold it up right now is, is really not a good idea um, the state wants us to move forward all we need is a fee to know what we have to pay what you're suggesting tonight is not out of the ordinary Interestingly enough, my suggestion is if you're going to do that with this one-time approval, you should be looking at that type of thing for every kind of application that sure. comes in. If I'm building a high-rise, right. I pay $160 to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It's ridiculous. These departments are doing the exact same thing, and in that type of a project would be doing far more. This is a building that already exists. So maybe this is a good time to say we should be looking at this for everybody, but don't hold up my client for that purpose. This is a one-time application. The state has approved one in the city of Brockton. It's not as if we're going to be going through this time and time and time again. So, and as to the fee, uh, Councillor Aneri uh, is, is right. It's for what work has to be done. So the numbers that I'm hearing, it is what it is. If that's what, if that's what the fee should be, then that's what the fee should be. My client is renting the, uh, the property. So the city of Brockton actually is probably now going to make more money because I think I saw the assessor around here earlier today. Uh, when he finds out what's going on, he's going to go back out and say, well, we're making a little bit more money at this property. Taxes are going up. You so betcha. the city isn't going to lose out on, on, the, on the taxes at all. Um, in, in, in addition, many, uh, what, what all of these uh, groups are doing, there's 20 that have been approved, provisionally approved in Massachusetts. Every one of them, including us, are in discussion with the municipalities about making a, 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 a pay, it's not really a payment in lieu of taxes or, a, or, or because there are no taxes. There'd be no additional tax that would be coming to the city of Brockton. However, because it's a nonprofit, In Good Health has, has already said and made an offer to the city, um, a substantial offer, and we're, we're gonna be in, in discussion about formalizing that. We also have a neighbor that we're, we're going to be uh, requesting an easement from. We're in discussion with them with regard to making a significant payment to a nonprofit to help them in their, in their situation uh, and so they can operate uh, where they are. 
So we're trying to be good neighbors. Um, my client, incidentally, has uh, uh, been a good neighbor to the city of Brockton for many, many years. They, they uh, developed, own, and operate uh, Bay Point and Heights Crossing. Uh, when I first got involved in this project, uh, one of the counselors said to me that this family has, has been a good friend to the city of Brockton. And, and we'd like to continue that relationship. Uh, we're, I think we're doing the right thing. And if the fee is 1500 or 2700 or 4000 we just need to move it along so that we can get, we continue to work with the department heads and, and uh, get to that point. It's going to make site plan approval a lot easier. But please don't, uh, don't table this at this point. I, I'm more concerned that it would hold up long term if we did put it through, but I don't think we, I don't really think we want to do that tonight, but thank you. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman or Mr. President. <coughs> uh, Mr. Mikowski, uh, I've got a, I think I'm going to ask the, uh, the white elephant in the room question here because I know you kind of alluded to it a little bit. Uh, in reading the paper tonight, uh, quite a few um, communities that are looking to license. you reading? The local paper. Uh, there's, um, th there's some assertion in the paper of um, these communities doing pretty well with, uh, with, this, with this new licensing that's coming down the pipeline. Because the way I see it, the only leverage that we actually have here in the city is this licensing fee that we are talking about. We're talking about an application. The application fee. But, but I'm actually going to come out and, and be blunt and say, what's in it for the city of Brockton? And I know you kind of said, you know, you're going to try to be good neighbors uh, because we're not really going to get anything directly from the, uh, from the owners of this facility in terms of taxes to the community. But what is specifically is in it for the city of Brockton? I mean, what, what specifically can you at least say to this council that we're going to get from, um, from allow? Because frankly, I don't like this process, to be honest with you, because it seems that the state has taken the powers from the local communities in terms of determining who the licensees uh, or who the operators of a certain business is going to be in their city in community. Because if they're the ones who are basically licensing the business, we don't have a say. I mean, we, yeah, you got to go through the zoning, you got to go through the planning and all the, all the processes that you got to go through in order to certify that, that particular need. But in terms of whether or not your agency gets a license to operate in this city or not, does not really rest with the city of Brockton as far as I'm concerned, right. correct? Okay. So I'm going to come back and say, knowing that this city will now, I don't want to say get stuck, but the city will now have to live with the license that the state is imposing on the city itself. So I'm going to come back and ask, what's in it for us? Okay. I mean, we've got probably more needs that, that most communities in this area. And it seems, uh, according, I guess, to the, to the uh, I don't know how well the, uh, the young man who wrote the paper uh, researched it, but it seems that these businesses will do pretty well. So I'm going to ask, you know, point blank, what's in it for us? And, and try to be as, as clear as you can possibly be. I, mean, I know that you can't really be very specific in terms of numbers, but at least you can give us an idea what's in it for, the, uh, for this community and, and the city. Because let me put it to you this way. It would make my uh, raising of the arm a lot easier knowing what's in it for us. You've asked that not once, but. I'm, I'm going to keep on asking. <laughs> So first of all, uh, when I first got involved in this, um, I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to represent a marijuana facility. But as I learned more and more about it, um, I found that it's, it's a treatment plan for very legitimate reasons. And, uh, and that, that gave me some, some comfort. And knowing that, for example, my mother who lost her leg many years ago uh, didn't have an option like this. She became a drug addict. She didn't know it, but she became a drug addict. They just kept feeding her Oxycontins. Um, and when they stopped her, uh, she lost her leg. I, I always teased her that she'd be out uh, knocking off pharmacies uh, looking for these things if, if she had two legs under her. But she went through a very serious, serious problem. So, so that's the first thing, that I think that this, they're coming in and serving a useful pur purpose in the city. Secondly, the first question I ask my clients is that, who are you going to employ? How many people are you going to employ? 
And I think the number is about 40, roughly 40 people. Some of those people are going to be experts in the field and perhaps won't be citizens of Brockton, but we made a commitment to the city to make sure that we would hire as many Brockton people as possible. Uh, the first part of it uh, was that I said, well, all right, well, our consultants and the people involved, we need to bring in Brockton people. So we've got a retired detective who was a Brockton detective uh, coming back in. Uh, we've got contractors in Brockton that we're working with to do the build out. Uh, I even discussed with a, a contractor tonight on the site work that we'd like to invite him in to take a look at this project. So that's, that's the first level. Uh, the next level is that many of these, every city in town that has a, a licensee is working out a payment plan. The easiest way to think of it is in, in lieu of taxes, a payment in lieu of taxes, but since we wouldn't be taxed, it's an additional payment that the city would receive. Um, in Good Health has made an offer to the mayor's office to, for an initial payment of $100,000. And that is for whatever projects, whatever use or whatever reasons they, they would like to um, uh, apply that to. Uh, there's, for example, there's a, there's a school in Brockton for um, uh, drug addicted people over at, at the fairgrounds. And that's something that uh, my client and I have re very recently been talking about uh, making an annual payment to them to help put that type of money right back into the community. Um, so first off, the $100,000 payment is, is, I think, fairly generous because they haven't made dollar one yet. Uh, I will say that that payment is, is structured over um, one or two years, one year. And it won't start, I think, until perhaps about six months into the operation. And we're more than, you know, what, we, what our next step is to do is to sit down with whoever wants to talk to us, but I know the mayor's office is very interested in, in, in talking, and we've already talked with them, him uh, about um, moving that plan forward and making some permanent payments to the city of Brockton. So to answer your question, we, we've tried to look at it on several levels, giving back to the community, bringing Brockton residents into the, into the mix. There's going to be people at all sorts of different levels. Uh, we've even talked with the neighbor next door uh, about somehow integrating uh, what they do with their disabled adults um, in, in uh, working in to benefit their program. Um, that's still in the, in the works, still in discussion, uh, and there's been no commitment on either side. Um, and the $100,000 payment and, and most likely a considerable amount more than that. So. I hope that answers your question. I, well, it we're kind really of does. making an effort to be a good neighbor. Um, and as I say, I go back to the initial comment on the councilor made that this family has always been a good neighbor to the city of Brockton. Let me ask you a question. Is this, um, is this a one-time um, forever and ever license, or is it something that's renewable on a regular basis? Well, it's, it's clearly renewable on a regular basis. Um, the... DPH, I just like, I have this little printout, I'd you know, be happy to share it with you. Um, the, the last piece of it after the final uh, approval and final application has been approved uh, is the ongoing piece in it, and it by DPH says continuous DPH oversight, annual renewal certificate, um, spot checks, and random audits. In addition, in the ordinance, I believe we have an annual fee uh, to fire, police, is that it? It might be one to board. I think, um, it, and it's more than annual. I think it's actually semi-annual, uh, okay. where the where the city's going to come in and continue to inspect. We'll pay that inspection fee. From what I'm hearing, that sounds like that's going up too. From, from. <laughs> but I guess what I'm asking is that you don't have to reapply for, for a license. This is a one-time thing. As Correct. long as you do your thing, your your license. Correct. But you review it annually. And, and they keep, I think the, you know, I think everybody's going to be watching this, but <coughs> as I mentioned earlier uh, uh, in the day, this, there's going to be a learning curve here. You know, this is a, a it's a first and, and only 
time that the city uh, is, is facing something like this that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is facing something like this. There's been a lot of criticism, there's been some mistakes, um, but that's gonna happen first time around. And uh, they have to, it, it's interesting, and I'd be more than happy to, to set up a meeting so that you could really understand how the whole process works and to show you the plans and walk through the plans with, with any one of the counselors. Um, I, I think I gave uh, Councilor Neary a copy of the application, um, it, but I'll, I'll be happy to make that available to everyone and sit down with you and, and walk you through it. Sorry, uh, McCluskey, if you could get it to uh, the city clerk, Mr. Zioli, <coughs> he'll farm it out to us, that'd be great. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, some of us were not, on, were not on the council at the time when uh, this, Thing was initially discussed so it's it's new to a lot of us but you know the concerns do exist for oh, even yeah. us some some of us newbies on the on well the it's a new, here. new new thing you know we, we need some practice at it and we need some revenue so uh, and, and and I keep think on you're writing the checks that. I know you're gonna see that uh, no more questions <laughs> thank you council bonds um, actually I'll, I'll withdraw I'll say council yeah thank you Councilors, any other questions for uh, any invited guests here tonight mr. chairman Dubois. Um, I'd like to try this again. I'd like to make a motion to strike 1,500 and replace it with $5,000. Second. Second. Motion's been made to amend the order, striking uh, $1,500 and uh, replacing that with, did you say 5,000 even? Yes, please. $5,000. All in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All opposed, that amendment carries. Entertain a motion of the order as amended. Re recommend favorably as amended. Second. Second. Councilors, uh, there's a motion made properly seconded, uh, favorable recommendation of agenda item number tw 23, this order as amended. All in favor of the uh, favorable motion, raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Mr. President. Councilor. Respectfully, um, I understand that um, you asked for no other taking of suspension of the rules, but when you look at the agenda, the only resident that is here that isn't an um, employee of the city is on number 27, which is the last of the evening. So I'd like to move that and take it under suspension of the rules if you would so allow me to. Well, that's my resolve, Councilor, so of course I'm going to agree. But I do want to know, uh, is Lisa Shea here? It was agenda item number eight relative to an appointment to the Cable Advisory Board. Ms. Shea, are you here? We're going to keep that until the end. Uh, motion was made. Was it second and relative? Second. Motion made, properly second to take number 27 out of order. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries. Councilor Neri. Yeah. Councilors, we're on item number 27. I recognize Councilor Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, I filed this resolve after I had a, uh, a really good meeting uh, with, uh, with a city resident. Uh, Jason's here tonight, and we, uh, we met up with Mr. Raleigh a while back. And uh, Jason had contacted me and my colleague, the Ward 6 Councilor, and I'll, I, I won't speak for her, uh, but uh, he has some, some major water issues relative to water pressure. And I think it really opened up my eyes for discussion. Uh, Mr. Raleigh was, uh, was great uh, taking the time. We probably met for an hour to go over uh, different variables relative to this issue. And it is really an issue plaguing not just Ward 6, but it's throughout the city of Brockton. And bottom line, it comes down to old pipes and no money. So uh, with that being said, I, I thought it'd be appropriate. And I know uh, the councilor from Ward 6 signed on to this resolve as well. I, I think it's appropriate to uh, to have the DPW commissioner here, of course, the city resident that brought it to everybody's attention to foster the uh, discussion of Mr. Raleigh as well. So with that being said, I don't think we're gonna have a cure tonight, but at least we can start the process to figure out a, a way to, uh, uh, to address this issue, not really uh, with a Band-Aid approach, but I think we have to think long-term relative to fixing the solution to this issue. Jason, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Councilor Sullivan. Uh, I have a short uh, briefing. Absolutely. Do you mind if I pass it out? Limited experience with city government, so I want to give I it to Madam Clerk. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to uh, thank Councillor Dubois, Councillor Sullivan. 
um, this whole committee for, for seeing me tonight. And uh, I think I went through this slide deck on the way over here, and it took me about five minutes, so I won't take any more than that. Um, and also, uh, the Mayor Brockton, I had an opportunity to meet with him to talk about the issue as well, so thank you all very much. Um, so, focus areas, just wanted to talk a little bit about the background, the problem, who I am, what I'm doing here, um, the scope and magnitude of the problem that we're having on Norwich Road, uh, some of the attempted repairs that have been made over the years, uh, what, what we propose is the fix, and so I've had an opportunity to meet with the Water Department and uh, talk about what the fix could possibly be and uh, other issues and hopefully talk about next steps. So again, my name is Jay Sklanewski. I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Brockton, uh, Ward 6. I grew up on Huffington Ave. Uh, both of my late grandfathers were city employees, uh, principal of Brockton High and um, lieutenant of the Brockton Police Department. So I have a great affinity for the city of Brockton, and uh, my late grandfather reminds me very much of the chief here, tough as nails, uh, but full of compassion. So uh, um, when I went to purchase a home, uh, I have a lot of family in Brockton. I didn't have to look very far to the little neighborhood over by Ashfield School. I found a nice little house or a, a wooden box that the bank lets me live in, I call it. Um, and, uh, you know, as a first time home buyer, I admit I was a bit naive. And so I was probably looking at things like uh, with the colors of the tiles and the, the light fixtures when I should have been looking at things like do we have a good water pressure. So the scope and the magnitude of the problem is, is pretty cut and dry. Uh, we, we, we aren't able to run any two water drawing appliances simultaneously. Uh, it's a systemic problem on the entire road. Um, and, you know, I have three small children, six, four, and two. So what I like to call the evening rush can be pretty difficult. So laundry, uh, baths, and, uh, and uh, cleaning dishes, aren't, you can't do that simultaneously. So uh, it's a significant quality of life issue. Um, there's also concerns attendant to the property sales. Uh, we had a woman across the street with a beautiful home. Uh, she had about two or three buyers turned away because of the water pressure problem. So uh, in talking to the water department, at least 22 residents from Norwich Road over the, year, uh, over the years have reported the problem to the Brockton Water and Sewer Department. And um, so it is a systemic problem, and I'm just here representing you know, not just myself, but, but the, the folks on the street as well. So if you uh, turn over just a couple of pictures of the water mains uh, that I pulled up online, and, and not to be uh, overdramatic, but that is a picture of my son in the, in the bathtub uh, with the water. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we know that the water mains are about 40 years old, four, uh, four decades old, and we know that there's a relationship between the quality of water and uh, the, water, the water flow, right? So you have uh, poor water quality over 40 years, lots of particulates, lots of clay build up in the system, and the result is what, you know, the, the, the corroded artery disease analogy, I like to call it, where we don't have good flow. Um, so there have been uh, several attempted repairs, and I just want to you know, say that the Brockton Water and Sewer Department, they've been incredibly responsive. So that they've come out, um, again, over 22 times and performed a procedure known as punching the corp, where they're basically trying to clean out any particulates and build up immediately where the, where the, where the resident connects to the main. Um, but unfortunately, only three homes out of those 20-some-odd homes have actually had any improvement uh, to their situation on the road. Uh, so I think that this band-aid approach uh, to fixing the problem has kind of run its course. It's costing the city thousands of dollars. Uh, that's a fact. And uh, what we think we really need is the fix, which is Norwich, Norwich Road, excuse me, needs a new, new water main. Um, so engineers from the water department uh, and sewer department estimate that it's going to cost in the neighborhood of $360,000. Um, I know that we're not the only residents in the city that have a need, but I just urge you to, to please consider it heavily, uh, given that it is a significant quality of life issue. And just to, again, to reemphasize, you know, I think everybody has some water pressure issue in Brockton where we're not talking about taking a shower and somebody flushes the toilet and then, oh no, I lose my pressure. We're talking, I'm taking a shower and there's nothing coming out of, out of the kitchen sink. So. Uh, 360 includes resurfacing, resurfacing the road, which is not what we're at. We're not asking for that. We're just asking for, uh, for the main. And um, to give you a little bit of a, an idea of how this, how this solution helped another resident, about 100 yards away by the Ashfield School, um, they had the same exact problem, came to the city, showed videos of the flow, you know, went through the whole process, and, and they actually got the main replaced, and it, and it solved their problem 100%. So I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Jason, I want to thank you. I mean, you spent a, a lot of time on that PowerPoint presentation. It's obvious, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's really eye-opening. 
Um, if, if we could uh, have Mr. Thorson and Mr. Rowley come forward as well. Should I sit down now? I'm not sure how that goes. Should I sit or should I stand? You can do whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Thorson, good evening. Good evening. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Right over here. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for coming tonight. Mr. Rowley, thanks for coming tonight as well. Um, Mr. Thorson, as I said, we, we, we took uh, probably an hour of Larry's time to, to kind of delve into this situation, and I think it's, it's really a situation that needs to be addressed. Do, do you have any, uh, I mean, I think, I think what the resident just provided us is pretty eye-opening, but do you have any input that you think, as a DPW commissioner, I mean, of course, if we had a ton of money, we'd be able to address it all, but we don't. So. Can you think outside the box and maybe some, some fixes to the solution? Well, um, I, what the gentleman didn't mention is we have spent uh, about a million and a half dollars on the pump stations up there to upgrade those to, to try and improve the situation. Uh, he is correct in that we do have online, or uh, 40 year old, approximately 40 year old pipe, which is online pipe, so that's uh, not the best stuff. So we, we're in agreement with him. He, he, we would need to uh, replace the, uh, the line up there. Uh, we'd have to look at the entire area up there. Just, uh, I'm not guaranteeing that if we fix one line, one street, it's going to fix the whole problem because the water's coming from other locations also as it, as it uh, goes through the city. Uh, one thing that the gentleman didn't mention is uh, he was given an estimate of about 360000 um, to fix the pipeline, uh, the pipe and the street. Um, obviously, if we didn't do the street, it would be a little bit less than that. However, uh, that cost of, a, of a 360 does not include any design work. So if we, if we went outside um, to uh, have this designed, uh, it would cost, you know, you're, you're looking at a cost of probably half a million dollars right now. So um, I know Ward 6 uh, does have some issues. I know the council from Ward 6 has been trying uh, diligently, uh, as have we, to get uh, funding for Tina Road. Uh, haven't gotten that in three years. So um, one, you know, we can, we can you know, discuss it in, with, with, this, with the, the CFO and see if there's any way to get it on the, uh, the uh, SRF loan uh, project, but probably not since, uh, I believe the last time the CFO gave a budget um, briefing here, it was uh, fairly dire as far as the water side goes, is not paying back the general fund, et cetera. So there are issues here that we have to look at, and we'd have to look at an entire uh, wide range uh, approach to this thing. It's not, like I said, I, I don't know uh, if fixing one street is going to solve the problem because depending on where that water is coming from those 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 streets may be just as bad so we're looking at uh, a fairly large evaluation that would have to be done of that entire area uh, the ward six area is as as councillor de knows is not um, uh, known for for its, its great water pressure that's hence tina road hence this street so there are issues that are, would take place up there um, out of the box, what can you do? Um, maybe assess a betterment fee to these, uh, the residents. However, that would require every, I think there's 22 houses on that street. Everyone would have to uh, sign off on that, agree to it. Um, that, that betterment fee would go against the, um, uh, the property itself, not necessarily the homeowner. So if the, if the homeowner sold his house, that betterment fee would stay there. Um, uh, one one thing um, that I'll say about a betterment fee, um, it will work out. I mean, it could depend, but then uh, depending on how you finance the fix itself, that money obviously is an up, for, up, up front cost, which may not be fully recouped over the you know. So we'd have to figure out a way to to pay it up front and then and then spread the payments out over the time. So. Um, however we did that, we'd have to, to, um, to, to work on that. Um, I'm not an expert in betterment fees, so we'd have to do, do some discussions probably with the legal folks and the, the, uh, the, the chief financial officer and see how the best way to do that would to, to approach it. Do, do you recall during your time in your capacity that, because I've been on the council nine years, I don't ever remember betterment. Does the, has the city utilized that at all? I don't, I don't um, recall that. Not not since I've been here now. Okay. Um, it was, uh, I know, uh, I think 
I think Howard's gone, but I, he could probably be the one that could tell us uh, when the last time it was done, but I think it was many, many, many years, many years ago. ago. Yeah, I think they did it for some sewer work, uh, just off the top of my head, 20, 30 years ago, but okay. I, I, I don't know if that's true. But it kind of, for whatever reason, fell out of favor. Um, it didn't uh, get carried on. It didn't become, a, uh, as far as I know, a real viable program. So um, <clears throat> could it be done? Yeah, obviously it can be done. However, the, the residents of the street would have to understand that that cost, whatever that cost is, um, would be borne by the residents of that yeah, street. The, the burden so would not, be on them. Uh, before we jumped into that, I think we'd have to be fairly confident that whatever, if we did go down that avenue, that that would fix the problem. Okay. So One question I had, I was sure. thinking about it when I was coming here tonight, and we're talking about water pressure of people, people's homes. What about the fire hydrants? God forbid there was a fire up there. I mean, are those... Are those pipes the same size? Would the pressure be, I mean, maybe that's more for, for, for Chief Francis, but I was thinking about that. I mean, we're talking about low pressure relative to homes, or maybe Larry, you'd know this. Yeah, we can let Larry answer that. We, we, we have enough pressure at the hydrants. From the hydrants? It's a bigger line, yes. Bigger line. It's a six inch line that feeds that hydrant, which is three quarter line that's going into a lot of, a lot of the residents' homes. Okay. I, I'd just like to touch a little bit too. Jason's absolutely right. It's mostly city related but when Campanelli built those homes the inside plumbing is very small also he, he used like half inch three eighths inch copper so that restricts the flow also in the homes okay that's what we're finding when 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 Jason said when we punch a corp we have decent <coughs> pressure at the main but as it goes through that three quarter inch copper into the homes it, it's reduced like 40 percent so, so even if the city year, spent the dough to, to fix the outside pipes to open that capacity up, you're still going to have potentially a problem within the, the plumbing within yes. the interior of the home? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to open it up to the, I'm not going to hog it. I'll open it up. Mr. Chair, I'll send it back to you. Well, you're all set, Councilor? Yeah, thank okay. you. Just, Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, this is probably from Mr. Thorson, just questions around. Um, so is this a issue with the, the camp the Campanelli community in Ward 6 so it's it's that widespread or it's by particular streets or we're finding this to be more of a problem well this isn't this isn't a citywide issue on pressure it's um, it's I would say localized up into that area mostly yes in Ward 6 yeah. Ward 5 and 6 with that particular style of home or that that particular contractor or who developed those homes Yes, you're correct. Okay. It, it, it's the way the, the infrastructure was built up there. And, and it's, it's one of the highest points in the city, too. So some of those, some of those homes are off of city pressure and some are off of tank pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the, the half million dollars that was quoted, I mean, um, it was in the PowerPoint, it was 300000 but my understanding with design costs and everything else, it's about half a million. I, I gave Jason a rough guesstimate. Mm -hmm. Just for the, that was just for the piping and the, and the road reconstruction, but you also have, um, you have to have it designed, mm -hmm. and then you have to have it, you, first you have to have an engineer, then you have to have it designed, then it has to go out to bidding. Okay. So you're looking at another 150000 for at least all those three. And that's just for that street, correct? That's just for that street, okay. correct. And then in the impacted area, Ward 6 and 5, how many streets are we talking about? Oh. Yeah, no, what's that? I mean, what I, number I, of streets? Uh, 500 <laughs> streets? I, 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 point point I of information? There's like. Uh, I would say it would be around 50 streets. Would Easy. Be, would be at, at least, least 50. Many. I wouldn't at say least. 500. I'm just, at uh, least 50. Yeah. Streets in the city, right? How many do you think? Yeah. There's like 3,000 streets in the city, so divide that by seven just to give you a rough number, whatever that number turns out to be. Seven, 280. 280. Um, Just, in, that's right. Map, which probably isn't very good. So we're talking about potentially 280 streets times half a million dollars per street, depending on the length well, of the street and stuff like that. That depends, Council, because the, the street in question here is only 1,500 uh, feet oh. long, right. Right. which Tina was double that. Got so it. to do Tina Ave was 1.3 million. Got it. Because we had to do a little drainage work there also. Uh, and my last question is, um, you mentioned that because of the plumbing in the home itself, that potentially 
solving the problem at the street level wouldn't solve the problem for the resident, it was potentially or That's certainly. correct. It, it, the, the plumbing inside some of those homes will restrict the flow. Even if we get 40, 50 PSI on the outside, it could be like 20 on the inside. Okay, great, thank you. Standard operating pressure in the city is around 60 PSI, 62 PSI. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council. Yep. Council, I told you my, Council, I told you my math was bad. It was, it's about 425 streets. Boy, it's not close to 500. Okay, thank you. Council, oh, thank you. And Larry, we have actually, Larry and I have talked about yep. a little bit about the pressure up there. And all the mayors, like I think Council Dubois said 50 streets, at, is that minimum? Minimum. Minimum, yeah. So to replace all that pipe would be quite a bit of money. Do you have anything in the enterprise account or anything for capital improvements? No, we don't. There's nothing, there's nothing in there at all? No, we don't. So I, I, I put it in this year's budget. I, actually, we put in $5 million for large main replacement, 500000 for small main replacement. I haven't seen the revised budget yet, so I don't know if it's in there or not. It's in for next year. Excuse me. It's in for next year's budget yes. is what you're yes. going to do. For, How much 15. for next year? For next year's. Well, how much did you put in the budget for next year, I mean? Five million for large five million? mean. Five, okay, it's in here, sorry. Okay, and we don't, we don't replace from the curb, curb car to stop at the street to the, to the, uh, to the homeowner's home. That no. line going in is, would have to be their responsibility. We, we go from the corporation, which is the shutoff on the water main itself, right to the cur sidewalk curb car. Right, so. We, we replace that. Right. From, from there into the home, that's up to the homeowner. We yeah. will do it while we're there, but it's going to be a cost. So it doesn't sound like there's really much we can do without any money. The homeowner is <laughs> going to have to, I mean, as, as far as, Can't. I mean, what is it? They've got a three-quarter line going into the house now? And most of the time, Councilor, that, that's, that's okay. That, that's fine for a single-family home. We just increased it now to it's, it's one inch. Yeah. And there's no, we don't, we don't put six inch mains anymore. We put eight inch mains. Right. But we still have some two inch mains in the city mm. that have to be replaced. So now we really don't have a main, re I mean, if, it, if it's taken out of the budget again, we haven't any money at all for any main replacements in the city. No, we haven't done any for the last three years. Yeah. We were doing about a mile and a half right. of water main replacement in house. Right. We were doing it. And then whatever we couldn't do, we would sub out to it and have a contract to do it. Right, and, and I think we were talking to you the other day about the main up there, how they put it on ledge, to how it was unlined, and whoever put that, mm -hmm. those mains in at the time was, was just ridiculous. So, I mean, there is no answer for really for this, for the city, unless the water rates, water rates went up, and I don't think that's going to happen right at this time. But, I mean, uh, they don't, I don't know what the quick fix is, fix is would be to possibly have homeowners to have those enlarged lines go to the house from the curb stop in. Maybe that would help them out, but I don't know whether they're... Uh, solution there is for, that we could come up with. But thank you. If you can come up with something. Well, we've been trying. We'd like to replace the mains, yeah. all the mains in the city, but that's, that's our difficult area as count, Council of Denapolis. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Council. Hey, Council of Du Bois. Thank you so much. Sorry. Either is fine. To be clear, a lot of people that live in the Brookfield and Ashfield and over in Ward 4 and the similar type of homes, that Campanelli style ranch, many of them have replaced their pipes already. It is a pretty common thing that maybe the first or the second homeowner would have already expanded that pipe. And it does help to some point. But in situations like Norwich Road and Tina Ave, um, I live in Ward 6, as we all know, and I live on Bank Street and I don't have water pressure issues so it's really not take the number of streets and divide it by seven so you can get the number. There are really significant issues up in the cluster of the Brookfield area where that new development was put in for the returning veterans. That was the point of that building and when it was put in, it was put in a rush. I like to, like to say that um, my predecessor, uh, Mr. George Cataldo, who we all know, um, when he moved into the Ashfield area, uh, there was a map that he lived on. The map of the development showed the drainage going out to Hovenden Ave and then down and he knew that the drainage didn't so he tied a rope around his waist and he got lowered down into the drainage pipe and he walked and he walked to the other side of the street. 
So what the plans say in City Hall is not what was put in up in the Brookfield and Ashfield in some areas in Ward 5. So we're dealing with some faulty development issues and natural um, degradation of, of, the, of the pipes. So I would say that there are 50 streets that are in critical condition. There are probably more upwards of 200 that over time are going to become in critical condition, but there are probably 50, and I would say right now I can name five that really need to be fixed. And Norwich Road is one of them, and Tina Ave is desperate. I mean, I tried to negotiate a deal with the previous mayor where um, we would do Tina Ave piecemeal over a four-year period of time so we could expand that $1.5 million over four years. That was agreed to. I, I told the residents about it. They were really excited about it. And over the last four years, almost no work has been done on Tina Ave because the money wasn't funded. And pipes have been brought up to Tina Ave and removed from Tina Ave twice. So the residents up there are rightfully really angry about it. It is a dangerous situation and the department agrees. So I am looking into the betterment fee structure. I'm going to be having a meeting on April 30th that, um, at the Brookfield School that anyone from Ward 6 or Ward 5 or has this water pressure issue is welcome to come to. It's going to be at 6.30 and it's going to just focus on water pressure and water quality and betterments. There are communities that do it. My sister's on the Finance Committee in Easton, and they just did betterments for the sewer there, and that's going to cost residents around one to $2,000 based on their frontage um, each year over the next 20 years to have that access to the sewer. So I don't think it, that betterments is going to be the solution for everybody, because there are so many people that live up in the Brookfield area that can hardly make their mortgage in their um, their um, tax bill right now. So a lot of, a lot of those streets aren't going to be able to absorb another $1,500 a year. Um, so there are different ways that you can deal with betterments. You can give some abatements to betterment payments. You can talk about the age of the person, maybe leaning the property. Um, we're looking into it, but overall we really need to start investing in our infrastructure. And I know that over the past, it's been kind of like it's Christmas morning and every child gets to open up one present when we're talking about street repair. So every year, one ward gets a, gets a road be repaved and it's like, you know, Santa has come to our ward and we're happy about it. And that's, that's one kind of fairness. But when you have two areas in the city, Ward 5 and Ward 6, that are dealing with significant infrastructure problems, maybe it would be even more fair to focus on those critical issues where we have children that are bathing in brown water that looks like pee, it's pretty gross, um, we're dealing, that's a, that's a health issue for me. So, I mean, I think, I hope that we kind of meet, we reevaluate how we're apportioning out the Chapter 90 money, and I know that isn't necessarily fair in one regard to the other wards in the city, but we have a whole bunch of taxpayers up in this area who really aren't getting what they're paying for as, as far as that kind of response. I mean, there are some areas in the city that need to have more police presence. There's more crime in certain areas, and more police officers spend more of their time there. Maybe, you know, Brookfield doesn't need the police officers up there as much as they do maybe in some other portions of the city, but they do need help with the water and the pipes. So it just, I mean, if we apportion the police like we apportion the street repair, I mean, people would be in trouble in certain areas. So it's just, just I really appreciate Jason coming in and Mike and um, Larry for coming in and talking about it. Um, and Jason, just for reinvigorating this issue. So thank you. Do you mind if I just have a Please. couple closing comments? Um, and so I just, and, I, and I'm a flight engineer, not a, uh, a water engineer, so I don't want to discount what the gentlemen are saying. But I can tell you that, uh, sir, my geographic proximity to the water tower is such that if the water tower were to burst today, we'd be washed away. And um, I can tell you that the streets adjacent to Norwich Road have excellent pressure. So with 22 residents, um, just to go on, you know, follow on to what Ms. Uh, Councilor Dubois is saying, with 22 residents on the road all, you know, talking about the same problem. Some of them have their pipes replaced, some of them haven't. I can tell you when I had my, my new water meter put in, I was, of course, uh, geeky curious about what was happening there. So I was able to look over the shoulder of the gentleman and just watch the flow coming into the house and that flow yeah, he admitted, I won't mention his name, um, that it was, it, was, it was substandard. So uh, I know you guys have a big problem to solve here and the infrastructure and the future and making sure that the city streets don't crumble and all that, but um, just want to remind 
uh, all you wonderful people that we're living, I'm living with it day to day. And um, ultimately, I don't, I, I don't know if I could live with it forever, but I do want to raise my children in Brockton. Uh, and um, I'm happy w with everything else in the neighborhood other than the water pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bonds. Uh, yes, I just kind of wanted to get something a little bit clear. Mr. Rowley, you mentioned, if, if you could please, and actually, um, Jason, the both of you mentioned something about the six inch pipe, and I believe, and, and Jason, I, I don't even want to try to pronounce your last name. Glenuski. It's a good Irish name, Glenuski. Glenuski, okay. Um, you mentioned something about the six inch pipe being bad, but then I believe when you got up, Mr. Riley, you said that that was kind of an improvement from what it was. I, I was just a little bit unclear, because your information says here that it's, it's bad. Wh which one is it? The six inch main that it's it's not huh, in great, it's not in good shape. Okay. It was it was put in in the seventies, I believe. Okay. Mid sixties. Mid sixties. And we've had pipes. We had pipes. We have pipes in the city now that have been in there since the early nineteen hundreds. Okay. And they're in better shape than the pipes in 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 five and six wards five and six. Okay, so but and you it's just, just a some... class of pipe that the builder used at that time. Okay, it's unlined pipe. Okay, which means most of your pipe now we use ductile iron and it's cement lined. Okay, so the unlined is just creates a discolored water. Okay, which you see in that picture. Okay, and with that, I, I don't. I, this may be more of a statement, um, but just looking at the photos that you have here. Um, it's really pretty bad, and if this is you know reflective of how it is on the entire street, the entire 1,500 square feet or something you said of the street, is there something maybe um, you can do to look into some environmental concerns with I mean with this stuff coming into the home and, and muddying up the pipes and the erosion, or maybe going that route for some uh, federal funding or something of that nature, grants or something? Well, we've been. We constantly reach out to our public health, or our, well, our engineering firm, just to look for if there's any free money out there, any kind of grant money that we mm -hmm. can get to replace some of these means. And it's just, it's, it's not out there. I mean, we can get a loan through the SRF funding with a 2% buyback, uh, uh, payback, but Mr. Condon would have to answer if we could even afford the loan mm -hmm. to do this. And um, do you think the residents would be amenable to the idea of that betterment fee, Jason so, um, Glenuskis? Glenus Glenuski. Um, Glenuski, sorry. It's actually Glenuskis, but they messed up my grandfather's name when he came over, so it's actually a Lithuanian name. Jason. Um, Glenuskis, yeah. Uh, so, okay. I'm okay with my taxes being raised and paying more for water because I'm the person that's having the problem, right? So that's in the spirit of full disclosure. I'm having the problem. So is betterment out of the question? Um, cost matters, of course, but it's not out of the question. And I mean, I can rally residents and you know get the 22 residents here or try to do that. But I wanted to lay the foundation for a discussion mm -hmm. and just to you know to outline the problem and to show you that it really is a real problem. The the picture you have of my son in the dirty water that the water isn't always like that. But, and we didn't bathe him in that water, but I did run and get my camera because I knew one day it might be a useful image. Um, so the water quality is poor. It's impacted our heating system. Um, and, and I think it really is a product of that old main that's corroded, like a corroded artery. The one they pulled out of uh, just 100 yards away, the Lamberts, just by the Ashfield School, he said that he couldn't put his finger through the, the hole in the, you know, basically finger size hole in the artery, so. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Also, Councilor? Yes, yeah. thank Any you. Any other questions, uh, Councilors? Councilor Sullivan. <laughs> thank you, Councilors. Um, I want to thank uh, the three gentlemen uh, for coming here tonight. Jason, I want to thank you. I mean, I, I have three children myself, but I'm fortunate because I can have the washing machine and the dishwasher and give them a bath at the same time, and you can't, and that's wrong. So we need to, uh, we need to act uh, really in collaboration we need to work together I mean that's why we run for office so we have to figure it out and I don't know how we can but I think when I was with you that day uh, with Larry I said the first step would be discussion so this is an education tonight but hopefully we can come up with something to try to address this issue and just on that in closing on that I would welcome any one of you counselors to my home for a cup of coffee and just walk you over to a couple of the other, other residents that also have children that are also experiencing the same problem so that you can see that it is real. 
We'll do that. Thank you. With that, I want to uh, make a motion for a favorable recommendation. Second. second. Motion for made and second uh, with a favorable recommendation. Go back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? <coughs> Goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Attorney Gilday is not here yet, Councilors, right? Okay, he is coming though. Why don't we go to uh, 24. Madam Clerk, number 24, please. Resolved that the real estate custodian, Attorney Benjamin Albany, 16 Patriots Way, Mansfield, Mass, be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss the position of real estate custodian and his plan for how he will undertake to fulfill the duties and responsibilities of this position. Invited Benjamin Albany, Esquire, real estate custodian. Attorney Albany, good evening. Good evening. Thanks for being here. My pleasure to be here. Uh, I took the initiative to uh, email everybody a, a memo in regards to uh, uh, my invitation here tonight. I, I hope everybody got it and had an opportunity to read it. Uh, has everybody had an opportunity to read it? Okay. Uh, as indicated in that, in that memo, the position, real estate custodian, is a statutory, mass general law statutory position. Uh, it's a mayoral appointment and the obligation of the real estate custodian is to uh, have the care, custody, and maintenance and liquidation of tax foreclosed properties. With the um, assistance of Marty Brophy, uh, I had an opportunity to read through the data and, and to uh, analyze what we had as an inventory. And what I've come up with is 307 properties that are uh, potential candidates for, uh, to be auctioned. It's a huge inventory and it's revenue to the city that's just been sitting there and some of those properties have been there for a long, long time. Uh, as you all know, or probably most of you know, previously I was in the law department of the city for 14 years. And while I was there, we recognized the potential to generate revenue through that process. And we created a program to not only identify those properties and liquidate them through the auction process, but to also identify what I found was over 200 lots that can be um, utilized through the Abutters Lots program, which, as you may or may not know, uh, is an initiative to find undersized lots that are uh, adjacent to residential property that can be combined with that residential property to improve the neighborhood and to improve the property that would, would acquire it. So I've found over 300 properties for the auction process and approximately 200 properties for the uh, About His Lots program. I have scheduled the first auction that I would conduct for the 24th of April. It would be, uh, it would take place in the GAI room down the hall, 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I have all of the necessary uh, notices, publications, uh, ready to go out tomorrow. Everything has to be done in excess of 14 days before the auction. Uh, the notice would be posted here at City Hall uh, at the, uh, I want to put one at the post office, I want to put one at the library, it's going to be posted on the city website. They're creating uh, uh, something on the home page. And I plan to do this hopefully every two to three months till we can get through this backlog of properties. It would generate a substantial amount of money to the city. And from what I've been listening to all night here, <coughs> sorely needed funds. 
Um, are there any questions you'd like to ask me about this? Council Dubois. Hello, Attorney Albanese. Thank Hello. you for being here. My pleasure. Um, I do have questions, but could I ask you to um, auction off Plot 28 Intervale Street in the next batch? Is there any way you could hold off on that until the next batch? I would really appreciate it if you could. I, I certainly could. I could talk to you about it later. It's just um, a whole community um, plan mm -hmm. for the village that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it would be a great property to bring back onto the tax rolls. But I just would like to talk to you about some concerns we have so that if you were to just give us two months, it would be perfect. And then everybody would be happy. Um, it, so you might be able to, you might consider that? I, I would absolutely consider it. There's plenty of uh, properties to take its place. I really appreciate that. Uh, I certainly. really, really do. So who was managing this before you were appointed? Uh, Marty Brophy was handling it. Um, I, I left the law department almost 10 years ago. Since then, um, the process has been substantially underutilized. In fairness to Marty Brophy, he wears two hats. Oh, yeah. He's a collector. He's a treasurer. He wears three hats. I took one of his hats away from him, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the only function that I have of the city, is to act as a real estate custodian. <clears throat> and I review all of the data in regards to these properties. And I do site visits, because you see a lot more when you take it, you know, I mean, something that looks good on paper may not be very good when you get out there. But there's, Nevertheless, when I cull through all the, all the properties that are potential, I'm going to find a lot of them that we can put on the auction block and generate a lot of revenue. Yes, Mr. Brophy was kind enough to send me the list of the properties that you had identified. And some of them, if I read the list correctly, it looks like the city is taken like more than 80 years ago. I mean, I may have misread the list. Are there some, pro how, long, how long has the city owned the oldest property that you can remember that's on that list? Like, what you may have, I don't know, did he give you the property card? It uh, was some like long list. Of yeah, the, build, the building might have been 80 years old, but okay. the tax taking, the tax foreclosure wouldn't be 80 years old. But there are some in the list that I've reviewed 15, 20 years old or, or more. Okay. So, um, the, you know, it's, it's like being a, a business owner and, and having inventory in your warehouse for 30 years. It's not an asset anymore. It's a liability. I know that um, since this is, so I've been on the council nine years now. And as far as I know, the whole time I've been on, we haven't had someone in your position. And well, Marty Brophy's been in the position, yeah, that's what but I mean. he couldn't devote a whole lot of time to it. Mm -hmm. So um, my initiative and, and my mission is to accelerate the process and be aggressive with it and to generate as much money as I can. I know I speak just for myself and the residents that elect me over in Ward 6, but I would love to be able to meet with you and talk about the properties that are on the list that are in Ward 6 and talk to you about um, some of the visions around community development that we could kind of blend two beautiful ideas. The city gets more revenue, and in some regards, we might be able to shape the development of a neighborhood in a positive way. So maybe we can set up a time to meet. I'd be glad to do that. I would really love that. And then the only other thing that I noticed is that you don't live in Brockton, and we have a residency requirement. Do you know um, how that gets worked around? Well, um, that applies to employees. I'm not an employee. I don't get paid by the city. However, if you wanted to characterize my position as an employee, I have grandfather status. Okay. My first employee with the city of Brockton was in 1970. Oh, so. I wasn't even born yet. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I can't say that to many people anymore. I like <laughs> that just reveals my age. But. <laughs> okay, I didn't realize that. And then, how does the payment get made to you? The payment, my payment? Yeah. It gets paid by the, the successful bidder, by the, high, the, the highest bidder. And it's a buyer's premium, which is very standard procedure uh, in an auction. And of that fee that I earn from the buyer, I'm donating 20% of that back to the city to fund the legal budget so that there will be more foreclosures. 
Not a dime comes to me from municipal funds. All right. So what is the buyer's premium? What percent? It's ten percent. So ten percent. So if, a, if something sold for hundred thousand, you'd get ten thousand. Right, and the and city would get two. And and then the city would get two. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Council Stewart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Albanese. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify your last comment, you said you're donating money back for the city's legal funds so that there are more foreclosures? So that more foreclosures can be processed. Okay. Uh, two questions. So what's the potential, the total amount of, of revenue that could be generated for the city if you were to place all that property for sale at once? I'm just curious what that number looks like. Uh, well, um, In the amended. just the property that's on the list for this month, if we just recouped, we and that the, the benchmark for me is, at a minimum, is to recoup the amount of taxes that weren't paid. For those six properties, if I'm successful in recouping that amount of money, it'd be 250000 mm -hmm. The last time I was involved in this process was when I worked for the city, and uh, it was probably over a six or eight year period we generated $6 million in revenue, which is the upfront benefit. And then the residual benefit is these it's properties back went back roll. on the tax roll. Right. Plus, it, you know, in most instances, it improves the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. so, so I can looking, only guess. So you're looking at six properties. Do you think the average will be around six properties per month? Uh, I don't want to do too many at a time because then, you know, the auction turns into a circus. And people have to come. I don't know if you reviewed the terms of the auction, but qualified bidders have to bring a check for $5,000 in certified funds to be able for each property they plan to bid on. So uh, if, you know, if there, there's a possibility that they were going to bid on, say, 10 properties, it, it complicates everything. So probably six to eight for each auction and hopefully every two months. Every two months. So that's well over a million dollars a year then. Um, I hope it's not overly optimistic, but I think it's okay. possible. Okay. My uh, second question is around um, how does uh, the city or how does your work ensure that the properties that are purchased uh, are purchased by you know, upstanding individuals? So, I mean, I, that's kind of a loaded term, but my, I guess my real concern would be having a lot of out-of-city buyers who become potentially Land. Initially, developers, but maybe they turn into slumlords, which doesn't help the process. So, how do you balance um, who gets ownership of those properties? Well, um, you're kind of obligated as an auctioneer to give it to the highest bidder. Jesus. However, um, what we plan to do, uh, which in the long run would reduce the density of population and pretty much ensure that it's owner occupied property. Because owner-occupied property is always right. much better maintained than rented property. Um, any property that would have the possibility of having a multi-unit uh, building would be through uh, a restrictive covenant in the deed limited to a single-family residence. Nice. So that kind of answers that question, mm -hmm. hopefully. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Well, well, thank you for your work, and uh, it looks like we're going to, looks like you're doing a really good job of leveraging you know, resources that have been sitting, uh, sitting there for some time, so thank uh, you. If you want to review them with me someday, I'd be glad to show you. I think you'll be shocked. Okay, yeah, I'll take you up on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jeffers. Thank you. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Albanese, uh, good evening. How are you? Good evening. Uh, this out of the six properties that you have listed in here, two of them are actual homes. That's right. Are there any residents living in these homes? One of them has. Uh, is, it, is it the, uh, it's the occupied. homeowner or is it a renter? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I talked it over with uh, Marty Brophy. He suspects that it may be a former owner, but we don't know who, who but we do know it's occupied. Is there any way we can find out for sure? I mean, I, I'd hate to, um, to auction off uh, a piece of property in the name of the city <laughs> and basically throw citizens of the city who might be, 
you know, hitting the old uh, bump on the road and stuff to the curb. Well, is there any way we can find see, that out before we do this? We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't. Um, I mean, all, there were times uh, when I worked in the city solicitor's office, and I actually we actually took uh, a property that had 24 residents, and I had to evict all of them. It was it was a hotel, uh, and uh, there are times when. We have to do evictions, and I would handle that. Um, this property, they haven't paid taxes on for a long, long time. They don't contribute to the city in any way in terms of taxes or any, any fees paid. So they're really living there for nothing. They wouldn't automatically be removed. They'd have to go through due process. It would have, the purchaser would either charge them rent or they'd evict them. Uh, we don't, as, a, as, a, as the city doesn't want to evict people, but we do need, we, we, are, we are mandated to sell the property. We can't just hold on a property that has come to us by default. The, all these properties aren't properties that the city would be wanting to take possession of. We take possession of them by default, and we have an obligation to sell these properties. Well, the reason why I'm asking is that, um, I mean, what, what criteria did you use to determine uh, which properties you're going to go after first? Because if I have the option of um, foreclosing on a <clears throat> boarded up warehouse versus a single family home where people are living, I would prefer to see the boarded up warehouse foreclose, fore foreclose first before the, the home where the, resident is, the residents are living in. Because I know, I know what the, uh, you know, a lot of people sometimes are thinking is that you know, we all have an obligation to pay our taxes, pay our mortgages and stuff like that, but there's also a thing called the economy and sometimes when it does tank, it tanks for everybody. So what I would actually like to see is that perhaps to do a little more research on this particular thing and find out, I mean, you never know if those folks that are living at, the, at one of these properties aren't paying somebody rent. Improbably paying somebody rent, but that, like I said to you, they wouldn't just be dragged out. There would be a process, and, it, and it's a lengthy process. But how hard, would, them. That, how hard would, that, would that be you know, for you before the 24th to find that out? Who they are? Who they are and who, whether or not they're paying rent to somebody before we throw these people out in the streets. Well, they, they would have a long time to find some alternate uh, housing arrangements. They wouldn't be dragged out on short notice. But if I, with all due respect, if I go to the site and I bid on this property, it's a suitable residence, I as the bidder would want my property. Yeah, you certainly would. And how can you say that you, these folks wouldn't be... Well, so are you saying that the city should subsidize these people? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we have an obligation to find out what's going on in the, in the particular... I don't think we do. Why not? Because that's not my function, and that's not the function of the city, to find out if they're squatters or whatever the case may be. And if they are the former owners, should we subsidize them? Mr. Abelnice, with all due respect, a few seconds ago, the council from Ward 6 asked you, asked you to take a property off the list, and you're willing to do that. It's and vacant. I'm asking you... It's vacant. I'm asking you to look into this home I will. where people might be living in, and you're saying it's not your job to do that. No, not really, but I will. I will do that as a courtesy to you. You know, because I think we ought to do it because it's, it's, we have a duty. We have a duty and an obligation as city holders to make sure that the citizens of the city are taken care of, especially, in fact, where there's a possibility that these people might be paying rent to somebody, they're victims in the process. We're not subsidizing anything. We're subsidizing whoever they're paying rent to. Well, so, they're not, they're not so victims. So we need to find that out before we basically... But they're not there. victims because they're occupying the property. So they're paying for occupation of the property. But if now, they're paying so rent... So if we find out they're paying rent to someone else, then we go should after. we tell them to collect rent, that we should collect rent from them? Because we don't have any kind of facility to do that. We don't have any system together to be landlords. I am not saying that the city should be landlords. What I'm saying is that if you have a home on your list 
a single family home on your list where there's people, people living in them. We're not exactly sure whether or not those people are paying rent to anybody, whether or not they're the homeowners or anything, or anything like that, and you're willing just to show up on the 24th and basically stand in front of these people's homes and say, oh, by the way, you've got 30 days to get out. We won't be doing that. That isn't the process. That isn't how it works. An eviction takes four to six months, typically. But if you're auctioning off the property on the 24th, right. a bidder comes up and says, here, here's my $100,000 or whatever they bid on the property, right. the sale is done. Right. So how can you say it takes six months? The sale takes six months. The people can't just walk in and throw out people that occupy the property. You have, there's due process of law for an eviction. You have to file a complaint with the housing court. There's a waiting period, there's an answer period. The people that are there have an opportunity to file an answer to the complaint. Then there's a hearing. After the hearing, there's an appeal period. After that, there's another period of time before they can be removed. So it wouldn't be an ab abrupt, but for you, I will find out who they are, I will find out the circumstances. But in the event that they're the former owners, how would you like me to handle it? Well, if they're the former owners and they haven't paid their taxes or they're not paying their taxes, of course, that, that's the process you go through. But what I'm saying is I'm here defending the fact that we have instances in this city where people are paying rent to a landlord somewhere or paying rent to a bank somewhere, and those people should not be subjected to being tossed out on the streets by their ears. That's what I'm saying. They're paying rent Ill to someone who's collecting it illegally. Correct, but it's not. And I will find that out for you. And I'd appreciate that. I would. Uh, and, and I'll take that off the list. I'd appreciate that. Uh, my next question is, and this is just to tag along with what Council Stewart actually had said. We, do, we all know that there's, uh, there's diversity in this city and there's language diversity in this city. There's uh, those who are well informed and those who aren't informed. How do we, as a city, assure that every citizen in this city, and I don't mean just put it in the paper and call it, you know, this is a notice on the paper. I mean, we have community-based organizations all over the city. We've got the ability to put messages on these message boards in the city. How do we assure that every single citizen in this city has the equal opportunity and access to purchase these properties? Anyone can attend. It's a public auction. It's no. open to the public. You're not answering my question. I'm asking you, I, can how I, do we as a city, how do we I as a city? Can I guarantee that every citizen of the city of Brockton will know about this auction? Absolutely, I cannot. What I'm saying is that if you come back to us, let's say, on the next round, and you say, look, we advertised it in the paper, we put it on cable, we, we send notices to the community-based organizations that works with the various communities in this city, then I can say, yeah, we did whatever we could. But if you come back and say, we put it in the paper and a half dozen people showed up and we sold it to the best, uh, to the best offers that we have. The highest bidder. I'm going to look there's, at you and say, you didn't no do more, your job. Let me ask you this. Is there any more level playing field than a public auction? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. It's public depending on who the public is. I'm, all I'm saying to you is that you... Everybody has access to this information. Not everybody does. Everybody does. Not everybody does. Yeah. What I'm saying to you is that you as a representative of the city have a duly obligation to make sure that the citizens of the city, and I just named a few of the citizens who do not read the paper, who do not read the paper, who might not be otherwise fluent in English, but yet they're citizens of the city. And we as, uh, we as representatives of the people in the city, we have an obligation to make sure that every single one of those members have the opportunity to participate in the process in the city. And I'm telling you, as a representative of this city, to make sure that that happens. Uh, I have certain statutory obligations in terms of notice. I encourage you and every other city councilor here, and I put it in my memo, to get the word out. I want as many people as possible at this auction the more people that attend and the more qualified bidders I have, the more money will be generated for the city. So by all means, do whatever you need to do to make sure that everybody knows, because that's much too much of a burden to put on me.
But you are getting paid to do this. I'm not getting paid to no, do no, it. No, you're going to get paid to do it. I mean, you get a percentage of the sale. That's right, though. You're going to get paid to do this. No, I, get, I don't get a percentage of the sale. No. My fee is over and above the sale price. It says it right here in black and white that you're going to get 10%. Over and above the sale price. Of the sale price. Not as part of the sale price. Oh, but you're still getting paid. I'm getting paid, yes. Okay. So what I'm saying, if you are getting paid, that you do do your diligence to make sure that the citizens are represented. Because if you're not doing that, what's the sense of us having... Now remember, you're going forward as a representative of the city. My job is to collect the taxes. That's my job, to collect the taxes as much as I can. And my job is to find the highest bidder for the property. And the highest bidder is the person that gets awarded. I don't care who it is. If you're suggesting that I'm going to disenfranchise the minorities in the city and not let that highest bidder, if it is a minority in the city, not be awarded the purchase, then you're wrong. Mr. Albanese, I'm not saying that you will disenfranchise the, the, the bidders in the community. All I'm saying to you is that we, as members of this government, we have the, the obligation, the obligation, when, when the auction goes forward, it doesn't say, you know, it's an auction being conducted by uh, Mr. Albanese as Mr. Albanese's properties. It's gonna say, you're doing it on behalf of the city of Brockton. That's right. So if you're doing it on behalf of the city of Brockton, the city of Brockton has a, an obligation to inform its citizens by whatever means necessary, by whatever means necessary to inform the communities. Because in the past, in the past, properties have been auctioned in the city and folks in the community have absolutely no idea that these properties were being auctioned. So what I'm saying to well, you is, is that we I, have to do a little bit more. This is what I plan community. to do. I plan to do the statutory notices and more. Statutory notices to put it in two public places. That's really all I'm obligated to do under the statute. I'm going to put it in three public places. I'm going to have it on the city website. And I'm going to have it in the newspaper. Is there a Spanish-speaking newspaper you'd like me to put in? I'd be glad to do it. I just mentioned that there's a handful of community-based organizations that people do attend and people go to. How hard would it be to notify those community-based organizations to notify them? The mayor's office has all that information. Uh, if you want to provide me with whoever you want me to give it to, I'd be glad to do it. The mayor's office has all that information. Then they'll get a notice. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, notwithstanding what Councilor Rodriguez was saying, I, I, I see his point and I also see your point. But, excuse me, if I were the, per, the, the person buying the property, the bidder, and I, I got my $5,000 you know, check, covered bonds and all that, I don't want the Johnsons in my home that I just bought for a steal to you know, build as I wish and do as I wish. So here I am, I'm gonna come back to you and say, hey, you know, what are we gonna do about the Johnsons and their two kids and their dog and everybody else in my new home that I just purchased from you? So I can see where he's, he's saying that that's gonna be an issue for the residents. It might even you know, turn into more legal fees that, that we've been wrangling with since, you know, at least since I've been sworn in um, and, and questioning those kinds of things. So I, I, I would just suggest just a friendly suggestion, even though it's not your responsibility, and I was reading you know, this as, as you were talking, and, and you're very um, fiscally focused, I guess I could say, that that is your responsibility to get function. this money back. I that get is it. my function. However, in that end, I would just friendly suggest um, doing a little bit more due diligence on it, situations or an issue like uh, Councilor Rodriguez brought up because in the end it might cause a, a, a kink or something in this particular program in getting that. So I, I would just kind of suggest that and, and thank you for taking those two off of the, um, the, the schedule and going further. But my, my, other, my question actually was if that were to happen, if I were, you know, Mr. Jones and I, Mrs. Jones and I bought um, the property and they're in my home I don't want to go through the four to six month eviction process of getting them out. So what you are you going to do? So you don't buy it. I'm not going to do anything. But I want that property. 
if you and want I got the property, my cashier's check. If you want the property, you take it as it is. That's how it is. Okay, see, something, is there an ordinance or something we can talk to about this? Because there's going to be a problem there. You, I mean, we can foresee the there's going is to be with an the, issue. If the buyer wants to purchase it, they purchase the whole bundle. They purchase whatever the circumstances are with the property, and if they need to proceed with an eviction on their own, that's what they need to do. And if they're an informed buyer and they know what the circumstances are, then that's what they bargain for, a property with an occupant. But le let me just put this in perspective for everybody. That's a very rare occasion that we have occupants in tax foreclosed properties. Actually, mm, I beg to differ. Um, you know, if, if and I, you probably have done this, but probably if you take a look at some of the deeds records, um, because I, I sit on some of the task forces and things and foreclosure and homelessness and all that other jazz here in the city, and there are a lot of folks who have bank-owned properties. They're still living there, and they're paying. They're, they're paying rent to, uh, as Re uh, Council Rodriguez said, what? to, you know, some other conglomerate landowner, you know, you're talking so about so two so different so things. Scissors. You're talking about bank foreclosures and tax foreclosures. Right. There is only a tax foreclosure after the bank has abandoned the property also. 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 If the bank was still involved, they'd be paying the taxes. Not necessarily. Yeah, necessarily. Okay. They um, know. They know they have to pay the taxes or they're going to lose title to the property. Isn't that what we were going through, though, earlier when we had, we were like number one in the state for the foreclosure? The banks just kind of just gave up on everything. Yep. They weren't paying the taxes. They weren't doing it. That's how we got in this mess that we're, you know, slowly coming out of. Thank God we're no longer so number they one. Would, but if the they banks, weren't paying anything. If the banks, taxes, if the banks abandoned the property, then the occupants would not be paying the bank's rent. But they were doing it not knowing that whomever they were paying to, they weren't paying. My neighbors across the street moved out one day because they, they were paying their rent and had no idea that, the, the, that their home was in foreclosure and that they were coming to get them. And they ended up moving that evening. It was the saddest thing on my street, to, to tell you the truth. So it is happening. And I, I'm, I'm just saying I understand well, your position. And, and what you Councilor's point of information, um, when a municipality <laughs> acquires title, they become the owner of the property. Okay. It's a process through land court. court. It's okay. a tax taking. Um, there is a difference between a bank foreclosure and when okay. a municipality becomes the owner through a tax taking, a okay. tax title. Okay, maybe when the that's tax taking I'm occurs, the land court does a decree. The decree <clears throat> is like a deed saying the city of Brockton is now the owner. Okay. Because these people haven't paid their taxes and because the bank didn't step up and cover the taxes. So it's, you're talking about two different things. Okay. What Attorney Albanese is talking about, he's going to be a custodian to sell city owned properties, okay. not bank so, owned, city owned. Okay. From a decree from the land court decreeing the city of Brockton is now the owner because these people didn't pay their taxes. Okay, thank you for the for the, the well, clarification. And then this, just, just one more thing on that too. That I that actually answered my question. For some of these plots, um, and I wasn't here for the very beginning of, of this, I apologize, but sure. are the surround I, I don't know where these, these plots exactly are, uh, but are they in neighborhoods where if, Families and things live like just, you know, like a house, house, rubble, house, house. Yes. Some of them are. Okay, so Some now. Some of them are residential properties. There's, there's two properties there with structures on them. One of them is occupied, and one has uh, a ranch house that's been abandoned for many years. Okay. And it's not your responsibility to kind of find out what the next owner is going to do with that? The, well, that's, you know, what they're going to do with it is controlled by. Uh, the building department, the zoning, uh, you know, zoning ordinances. Okay. I mean, they can only do what's allowed on that property. Okay. But we are going to control, to some degree, a lot that has the option to put multi-units through uh, a restrictive covenant in the deed. We're going to limit it to a single-family residence hopefully having owner-occupied structures there. Okay, so now also too, just in your experience in doing this, um, in reading your, your qualifications um, that you put on here, the, mostly the folks that come to the auctions are either representatives of big firms or you know so-and-so, so-and-so, or are they kind of small developers or just folks, people wanting to buy um, a property to build? Uh, big firms don't usually get involved. 
uh, there's, you know, local um, tradesmen. Um, and usually people that know what to do with the property show up because if you bid on something and you don't have the resources to develop it, then, you know, <laughs> you create a problem for yourself. But I sell it to whoever's the highest bidder. Okay, so if someone comes, if Jack Jones comes representing uh, Jones, Jenkins, and Fairfield, <laughs> <laughs> then, th I don't even know where that came from, yeah. um, then they <laughs> will not <laughs> quite, in, in, all, in all fairness, they will not be the occupy, ocu occupant of that property going forward, correct? No, they, I mean, if, if it's a single family uh, zoned uh, lot. Right. Um, usually the people that construct it aren't the people that live in it. Someone constructs it and sells it to somebody who's going to reside there. I don't know. I see a cycle here. I, I don't, maybe it's just me, but I, I, I'm seeing something. What are you seeing? <laughs> okay, here's, okay. Here's I, what I'm I need to share your vision. What are you seeing? Uh -huh. Well, oh, okay. I mean, Councilor Dubois actually just just gave me a, a term for it, land banking. But I, I can I what can see it? land banking. This but is I, a I public option. This is open to the public. This isn't going to get steered to anybody. Right. But I can see someone. And in, in from what you were saying, your only concern is sell to the highest bidder. The highest bidder is firm so and so and so and so. Yeah. But like you just said, that there would be a restriction on you know like the owner occupied situation. That doesn't wouldn't ha doesn't be so. have to be owner occupied. So we can restrict it to a single family residence. Ah, but that's uh, wouldn't that be how we got it? No, we got it because somebody didn't pay the taxes. Right. Fairfield. You're Jones making it much and, and more McCracken. complicated than it needs to be. Trust me. Okay, uh, I, 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 yeah, I don't. Uh, my okay. function is to collect the unpaid taxes and put these properties back on the tax rolls to broaden the tax base. Okay, I, I just there's it, more to, turn to it, it from than a liability into an asset. Okay, but there, there's a bigger part to just you know. Not your to my part job. On the chart. That's not the bigger part of my job. My job is to liquidate the properties. We got them by default. We didn't get them by design. They were part of a, a, a you know, a project. They were things that we would never have received as an asset to the city it if it wasn't through. thrust upon us. Right, I understand. But in order to not repeat that history is maybe to, to use your piece that the, your, you have you know, said a, a bunch of times that you're only concerned with and maybe sew it into the fabric of what the other concerns are. That's all I'm saying. It's just, it, it seems... I, I get where you're coming from. You're a businessman, that, business that's where you're coming from. That's your, your focus, but I don't see... Um Me being a businessman doesn't have anything to do with it. I am the real estate custodian. My obligations are clearly indicated. Mass General Laws, Chapter 60, Section 77B, tells me what I have authority to do and what I don't have authority to do, and all I want to do is do my job. Okay. Thank you. Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, I think there is a little bit of confusion. I want to thank uh, our chairman for straightening out some of it on the difference between a tax property and a, and a bank foreclosure. These properties you have listed, we already own, correct? Yes. The bank, the, the a judge has already said the city now owns it because it was not, the taxes were not paid. Yeah. Tag your it. So we own that. So right now, and for instance, and, and I, I understand uh, my colleagues' concerns about foreclosures, but if there's one of these and somebody's living in, and he's paying rent to somebody, he's paying rent to a straight thief because that thief does not own the building. We own that house right now. Right. And, whoever, and as a matter of fact, we have liability on that building right now. Right. Uh, so, I mean, uh, um, and you by law have to accept the highest bid, correct? Yeah. I, well, I don't have qualified no. bid. L let, me, let, me, let me qualify that. Yep. If I think the highest bid is not high enough. I, that was my next question. I, I, I can pull, I, I can discontinue the auction on that particular piece of property and tell them it'll be offered at another time or I can suspend it and say we'll go back to it later today. So if, if somebody, so it's not, it it's not an absolute auction. If someone, you know, get the property that's worth, say, 75000 and the highest bid is twenty, I don't, I'm not obligated to take it. And in most cases, 
as somebody who's been in the construction business. In most cases, single, these single family lots are gonna be people who build a house, a couple of houses a year, builders like that, right. who come and, if, and they know their business. And they look and say, okay, if I can get this for 35 grand, I know I can put a house on it, it'll cost me 80, and I can sell it for 140, I can make money. If it gets to 65,000, they're gonna walk away. That's typically the situation. The, the, you know, the big construction company has no interest in what we're selling. None at all. It's and usually local people and, and local contractors, local tradesmen that are looking to make a buck and to improve a neighborhood. Mm. And we need the money. Absolutely. So we welcome them to do it. And I don't care who it is. They pay a reasonable price and they're the highest bidder. God bless them. It, and we already own these. Again, I just want to reiterate, we own these. We absolutely own them, and some of them we own for a long time. And, and I ran into this at one of our last auctions. I had a contractor call me and say, you've got to help me out. He was a, I didn't know him. He was from out of town, and he had bought a pro property site unseen, and it was basically underwater, and he wanted the city to take it back. There is no arrangement for that. When a oh. purchaser buys this, he owns it, correct? They, they sign a lot of disclaimers uh, when we close. And even at the auction, uh, that it's as is. We make no representations. We, we don't even make representations as to uh, the uh, zoning district it's in. Although, I mean, on a rare occasion, that's that's well. And in, almost in all all the people that are going to bid on these but, are going to um, look ahead and they're going to know what what it's zoned for. If if you're not up to speed and you purchase it, you purchase it at your, at your own peril. At your own peril, and all sales are final. Oh yeah. They're so final. the idea, and again, I understand uh, Council Bonds' question, but the idea that, well, I buy that, I want that, you know, we, we should be doing something ahead of time about somebody living in it. Once they buy it, they own it. Well, if, if there's any comfort level to, to uh, this whole issue of occupied properties, very, very few of them. And that particular property, I didn't pick it. That was already on the agenda when I came on board. So I just took that and, and went with it. Um, I'll pull that off, no problem. And truthfully, if we take that off and we stay as the landlord, we should either be going up and charging rent, which I don't think we have any ability to do. We're better off we just selling be, it. Or if we were to keep it, we should actually be evicting people ourselves, well, which we don't want to be doing. We're not there's one business. good thing about having it occupied. It's, it's not being destroyed. Exactly. The copper pipe is still in the basement. Right. If it is a basement, right. I don't know where it is. So uh, um, I'll find that out for you, Councilman. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that I understood these are properties. We already own all of these. Yeah. So this is yes, we own them. money in our pocket Boy. and liabilities right we now. We own them whether we like it or not. Whether we like it the or not. The sooner we liquidate them, because they're not assets, they're liabilities. Nothing coming in but... Theoretically, there could be problems. And most you know. of the time, it's an improvement in the neighborhood. And if it's a, uh, an abandoned house, it's really our responsibility to, to have cleaned it up, to, to board it up and secure it at this point. I think it's Cassini's Yeah, at our point. expense. At our expense. That's right. why we don't want to hold on to these. The, right. You know, these are properties that we got by default, and they're not something we want to sit on. We need to move them. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Mr. Chairman. Albanese, I just have a few questions. Attorney Albany, I have a few questions sure. for you. One of your jobs as custodians to be the liaison with the outside council, Coppola and Coppola. Well, it's not really, but I'll do, I do it anyway. How often are they filing? Uh, are they doing it quarterly? Or I know some municipalities do it yearly with land court. Do you know how often you know, they're filing? Um, Marty Brophy handles that. Okay. Uh, and I'm just getting, you know, we're, we're going to we're gonna sit down with uh, Jim uh, Coppola and go over it. And hopefully, if we can put more money in the budget, we're, we're creating a revolving account to put this donation into and hopefully we can do more foreclosures every year but i i think i think maddie's on the agenda tonight so he can speak to that fit, man. Yeah. now in terms of the uh the clean title the title exams that show the city of brockton are these decrees or are they low value takings because there is a difference there's very few low value takings anymore um and uh they're decrees. The decrees. Um, low value takings are a little shaky. Yeah, they are. Because, you know, I actually handled one uh, years ago that involved a big parcel of land, and I. Uh, it's a rare event that you can overturn a tax foreclosure, but I did. Right. Yeah, that's it is rare. So at the auction, the city of Brockton, to the highest bidder, will give a quit claim deed, not a release deed, right? Be a quit claim. 
Uh, it's not even a quick claim deed. It's um, it, it's a it, it's a tax collector's deed. It's the, it's In the, other words, here it is. You figure out the title. As is, where is. Yeah, everything's and it's a as day is. Clo thirty day close. But generally, yeah, thirty day close. Generally speaking, though, uh, once there's been a decree. In the land court, it wipes out any any uh, attachments, any encumbrances. It wipes them out. So it's almost it's kind of analogous to registered land to some degree. But that's we just say here it is. You figure it out. My last question is who who's the actual auctioneer? Me. You're the auctioneer. Yeah. And you're a licensed auctioneer. Call don't me. have to be. All right. You Chapter one hundred, section eleven, actually exempts me from any of that really yeah and so and so does the uh, uh, chapter 60 section 77 B so there's not going to the bias premium which is going to you and you're kicking some back to the Brock and there's no additional fee because you're the auction holder correct okay Constance why you had a question yes I just have a few more questions follow up so do you send a note to the house that's being auctioned that the house is going to be auctioned so if there are people living in there are they notified by you or the city that their house is going to be auctioned on a, you know they, not their house but the house they're residing in is going to be auctioned on this date no okay well l let me qualify that we're required <laughs> to give a notice at least 14 days prior to the auction to the address of the last owner of record okay so if if it's owner occupied, they get noticed. So how do you know, in just this example that you were talking about earlier, how do you know that there are people living in that house? How do you know that? Um, well, the information was given to me. Okay. Who has it firsthand? Uh, probably a health inspector. All I right. Don't know. Because I'm just wondering if you could, if it would be easy for you to just, when, when you prepare your list, or maybe even take all 300 and do a mail merge and send them out a letter and say, if you live in this house, we're, we're auctioning off at some point in the coming year so they all know that it's happening. And then you're more or less covering That's your- That's a huge expense and a lot of work for oh, really? very little, for very little results. Yeah. Almost nobody lives in yeah. these houses. This, I know. This one house is probably one of maybe four or five in that 300. And like on this list, there are only two lots that have street addresses. So that right. means there are only two houses on this list. If so you if see a plot, it's a vacant lot. Yeah, exactly. So it wouldn't be too much work just to run through the list and send a letter to that house and say, hey, if you live here, your house is being auctioned. Well, I mean, it could be. You know, years, or I could do years it. down the road. I have the list. I could do it myself. I could send a like because I can do that in a half an hour. So you know what? I'll do that for you. And then I encourage you to do that. I will do that. Just as part of, of part of like notifying the public. It's the only right thing to do. And then next, that's my public service. You know, um, <laughs> who provides oversight to you? Yes. Who provides your oversight? Well, I'm I'm accountable to the mayor. You're accountable to the mayor. And so. Um, what kind of reports do you give them? Like, what kind, of what kind of reports can we expect? Will you tell us who buys it and for how much? How will we be able to find that out? That'll all be public record, but I'll, you know, every time I have an auction, I will send all the information to all the councils. Yeah, I would love want, to do it. Yeah, even if you did it by email or by paper, either way is fine with me. Um, do you tell someone that people are living in the property when you're doing the auction or no? Absolutely. Oh, so you do. So someone that's going to buy it is going to know that there are people residing yeah. in the property. Great. Yeah. Um, can a city employee, their family member, their business, or a business partner participate in these auctions? Anybody can. It's open to the public. So any city employee can come in and purchase the land? Sure. No conflict? No conflict. All right. Um, how will the deed restriction be placed? On the deed. How will you do that? What, what will you Language do? Language in the deed. Yep. It but, gets recorded with the deed. So you're at the auction block. What do you say? You say this, I'm going to be auctioning. It's going to be, there's going to be a whole list of terms and conditions. <laughs> They're going to have to sign that they got a copy of it. Okay, so on that terms of conditions, say like plot 371 Quincy Street. Mm -hmm. If someone comes and they want to bid on that, say that's zone C1, right? They're going to see in the city records that it's zone C1, but you're going to have in the piece of paper that they signed that they can only put single family home on it. No. If it's residentially zoned, for multi-unit, we're going to restrict it to a single-family residence, only in residentially zoned properties. Commercial okay. is going to be governed by the zoning ordinance, 
having to do with commercial property. All right. So then I guess my suggestion to my fellow counselors at this point is to look at the lots that are in their ward and see which ones they are and then see how they're zoned. Because like this one in the village, that's going to be good because I know that's zoned R2. So you're going to sell that. And if you, when you auction it off, there'll be a deed restriction that they can only put a single family home there. But we all know in Brockton, I don't commercial. You mean, you mean Intervale? I don't think yeah. It's, did you say it's R2? It's R2. I think it's C2 now. Mm -mm. Well, let me look. You yeah, take a look. I think it's R2. I think I just checked it. And that's what it says on the city's website. Had a big multifamily on it that burnt down. C1. See, that isn't okay. It's C1. Well, then it's good that you're taking it off the, the list for now. Was, was grandfathered. Now it's yeah. C1. But you're taking that off the list till the next time. As a courtesy to you, yes. I really appreciate that courtesy because it's going to be able to help me so much. Okay, so then, again, I would suggest that my fellow city councilors look at the list. I'll forward it to you. And then look at the plots that are in your ward. And if they're zoned C1 and it's in a residential neighborhood, you should rezone that area before it's sold, right? Because in Brockton, we all know that the zoning in the city is a mess absolute mess. You can be living in a single family home neighborhood and all of a sudden the liquor store opens up next to you. It's insane. So I appreciate, uh, and that's none of your fault at all, so don't, please don't take it as me blaming you because it isn't your fault in any way, but it is something that everybody here should be cognizant of and if you live in a neighborhood and you're interested, you should look into that as well. Thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. Councilman, do you have a question? Just a quick one. <laughs> you want to know? <laughs> On the abutters program, yes, I noticed uh, you've recognized over 200 that are uh, that may uh, be appropriate for those. Are you planning on, no on uh, no uh, notifying the uh, owners and what have you? Yes. So that's that's going to be sometimes something. there's two abutters. Okay. So there's a process to figure out which one is going to get it. <laughs> okay, but, but sometimes both of them don't want it. Right. Well, yes. I don't think we've dealt with too many of those. I and mean, once in a blue moon, something will come up. But you're going to be offering these. At, at, a, at a nominal amount of money. Right. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Council, I entertain a motion. Motion recommend favorably. Second. second. Motion made, recommend favorable. <clears throat> Full City Council properly second. All in favor, raise your hand, please. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Councilors, we can. Motion is for me to leave. <laughs> Councilors, we can either go to 19 right now because the attorney's here, or 25, which is. Talking about the same thing. I don't know who filed that resolve. Councilor Dubois, um, did you file this resolve? Councilor President, I ask that we go to 19. Go to 19. Yes, please. All right. Number 19, Madam Clerk. Ordinance. An ordinance amending Article um, 16 of the Advised Ordinances of the City of Brockton be ordained by the City Council of the City of Brockton as follows. Chapter 19, Police Department. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Maureen Cruz, Personnel Director, Mark Gilday, Legislative Council. Mr. Mayor, good evening. Is it my turn? <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Councilors. Um, I believe that the ordinance that's in front of you now is not the most recent substitute ordinance that's been developed. Is that correct? Because the ordinance that was sent uh, from the council to finance is not the one so I think this requires uh, some action by a counselor before we could consider the new substitute one attorney Gilday or attorney Gilday or Nesrala the closest available attorney I think that the the ordinance that's before the council is the one that was referred from the council right so that's the one that would be discussed until, unless a counselor so Unless a counselor offers a substituted ordinance. Yes. Okay. So does anyone here have any questions on the old ordinance before I, before I do what I'm gonna do? If anyone does, please feel free to speak about it. No, then can I have the floor? Is that through the chair, counsel? Yes, that's through the chair, I apologize, exactly. Counsel Dubois. Thank you very much. So I want to start off by addressing um, the notion that um, is in the media um, from some skillful public relations that um, 
there's unanimity and just total agreement in the city um, about this appointment. And that the disagreement on the council um, is an ab aberration. Because um, I had a ward meeting recently with 45 people in attendance. And I asked them, how many of you think it's OK to have a part-time lead enforcement officer in the police department? And of the 45 people in that room, only two people raised their hands. So um, there is not just everybody in the city agrees with this. And I've gotten many phone calls very upset by upset residents about changing a, a law and going against the state's um, requirements. So I just want to say that first off, the, the, the comments to the press that the city council should get on board with the rest of the city because we're, you know, the city's in agreement and the city council is the only one that isn't, that's patently false. Um, and, and it's really what's going on in the city council and our disagreement on this issue is a pretty good reflection of what the public opinion is. Um, that said, this, this ordinance that I'm going to present is an attempt to bridge those differences. It may not be what the mayor's office first envisioned with the civilian full-time commissioner who would have no arrest powers and would not be able to carry a city-issued um, firearm. Um, but it must be said that the mayor's office initially envisioned the new commissioner being full-time and not part-time. And the Boston Retirement Board put an end to that um, option in mid-March. And that's a, um, so when I read the, when I read the um, editorial on Sunday by the Enterprise that laid out this whole argument in the press, it totally left out the fact that the person that you had chosen for this position that we were discussing an ordinance for, um, can't work more than 960 hours a year, which is half time, and that works out to 18 hours a week. So um, I just want that the public to know that you have city councilors up here that are looking out for your interest, even in the face of some very significant public relations um, attempts to smear us really just caring about the citizens of the city. So I have law enforcement in my, in my family. And the idea that a member of my family is going to go out and put their lives on the line and to serve all of us with a part-time person managing them is just totally unacceptable. And I think most people in the city agree with that. And uh, further, I think a lot of people in the city find a... a council, I just, if I could add one quick comment. No? Excuse me. No. Okay, I'll wait my turn. Um, so the, the, the fact of the matter is we stand here today with um, a proposed <coughs> ordinance that if it were to have been passed like the wishes of some in the public two months ago, we'd be sitting here with a, an ordinance that had the creation of a, of, a, of a civilian commissioner and we would be sitting here with that ordinance and now only find <coughs> out that they can only work part time. So really, yes. by the city council reviewing the issue and taking our time and looking at all the pros and cons and being diligent and being respectful of the se severity of circumventing state law, we actually um, bought enough time to realize that, um, that the <coughs> plan that the mayor put forward was impractical and actually impossible. So at, when, the, um, when the state came down and said, that um, the person that the mayor wanted to put in this position could only work 960 hours a year. I knew that that was our opportunity to make a, make a, make a um, compromise. And I appreciate that the mayor, um, in his rational thought, sat down and saw the same, same problems and agreed um, that we can come up with a new solution. And I don't think everybody is going to be happy with this replacement ordinance. But I forward it tonight for the same reason that I find it totally unacceptable to have a part-time leader of our police department. It's a city of over 100,000 people, and this has nothing to do with any one person in that position. I don't think Superman could lead the Brockton Police Department in, in 960 hours a year. 
And for <coughs> anybody that says differently, if you don't live in Brockton, I say go back to your hometown and have them have a part-time lead enforcement officer. Because I've spoken to many people that are from Bridgewater, Abington, Avon, who are really in support of the part-time police commissioner idea for some reason. But when I look at them and I say, well, then you go home to Avon and you have them have a part-time civilian police commissioner, they change their tune. So I'm really happy that we have come to this solution. And what this solution is going to do is it's going to maintain the police department with a sworn officer at its head who is just, who's come up through the ranks. And when it's put through, we are going to have a sworn officer leading the police department. We are going to be able to benefit from the excellent historical service, his knowledge, and the capacity of Mr. Hayden, which is right in his wheelhouse to give his advice, his direction, his um, expertise on law enforcement. And I'm really happy that we've come to this solution that I think really brings the best of both worlds, where the city gets a wonderful, um, person who's dedicated his whole career to police enforcement, who has excellent ideas and really good skills and knowledge, but we get to maintain a full-time sworn officer at the head of the police department, because anything else would be unacceptable. So at this time, I'd like to forward this um, replacement ordinance, and should I read it, or would this be something that Mark Day would read? Counselor, you can read it, and it's a, it's a, it's a substitute order, Counselor. Substitute order. Thank you. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Mr. President. Counselor Stewart. Mr. Pre uh, point of, uh, I guess, information here. So with Counselor Dubois pushing forward her, her new order, uh, how are we, a substitute order, how, do we, how are we able to have conversation on the previous one if it's strikingly different than what she's proposing? That's why I read it. So I'm not understanding. Council, if you want to talk about the previous one, it has to be before a motion to uh, accept the substitute order is voted upon. So if you want to talk about the one that is presently here on the agenda and not the, the substitute order that Council Dubois, you should talk on it now before a motion is made. I'd like to do that, Mr. Chairperson. Council Stewart, go ahead. Thank you. And I'm not exactly certain what the differences are and what Council Dubois is proposing, so the differences may not be that striking. Is it appropriate to ask for a recess while we review this document? Take a uh, three minute recess. <laughs>
can bring the old guy. Back in session, Council. Council Dubois, I was Council Store. You had uh, the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. And in fact, um, the so I'd like to discuss the, the new ordinance that's, I guess, now proposed by Council Dubois, I not the previous one. Point of information through the chair. Council. I haven't proposed it yet. I'm willing to propose it, and then you can discuss it, but until it's proposed, is it discussable? I'm, I mean, I'm about to propose it. I, I wouldn't get too caught up on what we're discussing. I think it's the same subject matter. So whether it's the old ordinance or the new ordinance, I think you can move forward. All right, so I have a floor? You have it, Council. Great. So, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, good evening, Council. Good evening. Good to see you. And um, again, I just wanted to set a bit of context and that I really appreciate the efforts that you're bringing to the office. And I know that you've made a number of campaign commitments and it seems to me that you're trying your best to fulfill them. Uh, and so that's very much appreciated. Um, I will say too, and I don't normally say this publicly, but I did not vote for you. Uh, and I've, <laughs> um, I think there might be a lot of that him. here in the room. He was a write in vote. <laughs> How do we know for sure? Um, no, say it back to him. Uh, but I say, yeah, that's right. Right, you didn't vote for me either. Uh, but, but I say that because it's important, it's important um, for me to express that I've been as supportive of your agenda as possible because elections do have consequences and I think it's my job to make certain that the campaigning stops when we get into office and we start working together and we start to govern. So I set that um, out there as an important Point so that people um, just understand where I'm coming from, and my commitment to you is really my commitment to the to the city. Good question, yeah. um, I have questions though about this this new phase of work that concerns me more so than how it existed previously. And so, ironically, uh, I'm less in favor of the direction that we're going in at the moment. So I have a couple questions about how this will work. Um, so my understanding is that you made an assessment that the police department needed. Uh, some retooling um, and that to make certain that that retooling process were successful that you needed someone from the outside with great skills and experience to come in and do some of that reshuffling and that that was clearly an assessment made which is why we started this arduous process that it was not wise to have someone from the inside try to make those kinds of adjustments and I'm assuming because you know when you have as you know, we discussed in politics uh, often, and part of my work has been when relationships sometimes get in the way of a person's best professional judgment, you don't deliver to the taxpayer the best return on their investment. And so having an inside police chief uh, try to make the changes that you envision needed to be made uh, was a tall task, and so we went through this whole process to bring someone from the outside. I understand that circumstances have changed, but this is what concerns me based on how this is structured. We now have, as proposed, uh, someone from the inside who I, at the moment, don't know enough about, but that's another process once we get past, past this. But, um, and I've got mixed reviews about this person, so I have uh, just a laundry list of questions about that potential appointment. We're talking about Mr. Mr. Crowley, I believe. But, um, so at the moment, we're looking at having someone from the inside uh, take on the role of being the reformer which from my understanding was a difficult task to take on to begin with. We now have a Mr. Hayden acting, not necessarily in title, but certainly it seems in function as a consultant so that this new, whoever this new police chief would be, would take the advice of Mr. Hayden, but doesn't report to Mr. Hayden. Uh, and so as a police chief, if I were in that position uh, and I'm being held accountable as the chief, I would certainly listen to someone's advice but if I disagree with that person, I would not take that person's advice. Uh, and so we go back to the problem of then this person being inside of this police department with those relationships, having to make extremely tough decisions and probably choosing not to make those tough decisions because of those relationships, which is what we tried to avoid with all of this to begin with. So how do you reconcile where we are at the moment? Well, to go back to the uh, beginning of your question, I, I think the assessment that I made was that Bob Hayden was uniquely qualified to lead the Brockton Police Department and that there was no one else available that uh, possessed his skill set, his leadership skills, his decades of uh, urban crime fighting experience, and that this was a very unique opportunity uh, that when I asked him if he would consider leading the Brockton Police Department, uh, he accepted. 
So uh, it is a unique situation, and, uh, and so that's what brought me to bring forward a uh, proposed ordinance to create a, a civil police commissioner. Um, I think that um, in terms of if folks don't feel comfortable with the 960 hours a week, uh, 960 hours a year, um, it's a little more than what was stated. It's 960 hours in a calendar year, which would have begun on January 31st. So it's 960 hours over 11 months this year. Um, but I would just uh, suggest that uh, they ask members of the Brockton Police Department what they think, many of whom are seated here, and seated here in the room right now, because I will tell you that the chief has overwhelming support uh, among the men and women who place their lives on the line for us every day and night in the city. And I think he's demonstrated over the last 60 days what he's capable of doing. I think he has tremendous support among the troops. And uh, I honestly don't think the men and women of the Brockton Police Department who are following his lead really particularly care how many hours a, a, a year he's working. Mr. They're President? ready to work for Chief Hayden. I have a point of information. Um, a point of information. Council. A request. Um, is it? Aren't we supposed to be talking about enacting the ordinance and not who is going to be serving in the position? That's correct. Let's get back on track. It's relative to not the appointment per se. That's offline. Uh, it's about the ordinance and if it's going to be enacted, and specifically the substitute ordinance that was presented tonight to the council as finance committee. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Chairperson, with that would be great if that was consistent, but I think Mr. Hayden's been referenced all throughout this debate. I, I agree, and I think it's actually intrinsically tied to this actual creation of this order. You can't I wasn't talking about Mr. Hayden. I was talking about earlier you were talking about a potential police chief, and oh, that's I not see. what's before us this evening. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. Agreed. So, so continue. Oh, so, uh, so obviously the, uh, you know, I think that, you know, Mr. Hayden possesses uh, a number of tremendous qualities that uh, qualifies him to, to lead the Brockton Police Department, one of which you described. I think that uh, there has been an advantage to him coming in as an outsider to be able to affect change. But I think there's a lot more to, to Chief Hayden than just the fact that his experience comes outside the city of Brockton. So the. Um if you could sort of articulate again what the chain of command is. So it's the police chief reports directly to you. And I, don't, I don't think actually the police chief even reports directly to me. I think no. the police chief is appointed by me, subject to confirmation by the council. Uh, but I think that the police chief is fairly autonomous under law in terms of how they run the police department. Um, I think in the model that's proposed here that uh, I think is a fair characterization fr from Council Dubois, I mean, this is a compromise. Uh, this is, represents some, some give and take on both sides. Uh, do I th think this is a perfect ordinance? No. I suspect most of the councilors don't believe it's a perfect ordinance either. Um, I'm hopeful that the majority of you will feel as though it's a workable compromise for a one-year model. Uh, this, we're not looking to redesign the wheel here. Uh, I've asked for an opportunity to let the person I select lead the Brockton Police Department for one year. Now, through the evolution of this, um, clearly it became apparent to me that the original proposal that I had made was not going to be capable of garnering uh, two-thirds support from the council. And I think as that became apparent, uh, I think that uh, what we've endeavored to do here is see if we could come up with something that could meet the concerns expressed by some of the counselors, but still leave me with a comfort level that um, the Chief Hayden will still be in an important position overseeing many aspects of the, of the Brockton Police Department. And some of that is specified right out in the ordinance because I think he has a tremendous amount to offer and I think that uh, any person who ascends to that position of Chief of Police I believe would make then Commissioner Hayden their closest and most trusted advisor. And I think that the respect that Chief Hayden commands from the men and women who work under him will not change regardless of what the language in the ordinance is. So my concern, so, but Mr. Hayden, at the way it's written at the moment, and again, I was a, more of a proponent of the earlier version, is that he would serve as an advisor. So what powers would he have exactly? 
He would be giving advice to the chief that holds the power. He's a liaison between the mayor and the chief of police. And I think it outlines you know, some specific uh, areas such as deployment of resources, tactical uh, areas that would play very strongly to uh, Commissioner Hayden's strengths. But in this role, he's not overseeing anything as an advisor. The, the, the department would be run by the chief of police. And do you not have concerns that the chief of police who would be autonomous, uh, as you indicated earlier, could or could not take the advice of Mr. Hayden? I think that uh, I think the ordinance does would allow the chief to ignore the advice, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think that would happen, but I think my reading of the ordinance would permit that, yes. Because I would envision that if, you, if the police department is in the kind of condition where it needs, this, needs some heavy reform, there are going to be some extremely difficult decisions coming before the next police chief who, again, has those relationships built in. And the concern was that those tough decisions would not be able to be made because of those relationships. Well, I, I will say, Council, that I believe the Brockton Police Department today uh, is in far better shape than it was 60 days ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, in terms you know, of morale, mm -hmm. operations, uh, you know, I, I think that dramatic change has already, already been affected in just over two months. Um, no further questions at the moment, Mr. Thank you, Council. Council Dubois. At this time, I'd like to um, read uh, the substitute ordinance. So, right. thank you very much. Um, I want to first thank uh, Mayor Carpenter for meeting with me a couple Saturdays ago and being so kind as to open up the City Hall for us to sit down and talk about our issues. Um, and I understand your point of view, um, and I think that you understood my point of view, which was I didn't really much care how we got to the solution, but I wanted a full-time sworn officer as the head of the police department. And as the facts of the matter stood, it seemed like that was something that you could agree to, and I appreciate that. And in the end, I think we would be all better for it. And um, here it is. An ordinance amending Article 19 of the Revised Ordinances of the City of Brockton. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Brockton as follows. One, Chapter 19, Police Department is hereby amended by adding the following.